to the Academy in Belgium, yes. uh, which is a unusual, I would say, uh, background, uh, at least you know, maybe the first academic I know uh, with this particular background. So I was wondering if you could share with us the story behind, so why military academy and how it's different from a regular university in terms of research? Well, uh, I don't think there's a very good answer for the why. Sometimes people make choices in their life and things happen. Um, what, what can be confusing for many people is that um, uh, back then and still now, I mean, uh, the academy had uh, two divisions. So one was the, uh, the division which was mainly focusing on the training of the military officers, whereas the other division uh, was also training them as polytechnical engineers. It's a bit of the copy that Belgium made of the French system of the Ecole Polytechnique. So it uh, goes back to the very beginning of the existence of Belgium. So for those who don't know, I originate from Belgium. Huh? So that should be clear by now, I guess. And uh, basically, Belgium installed something that was dual to the Ecole Polytechnique in, in Paris and in, uh, in France. And uh, also since then, they have been organizing also competitions with each other. So the, the mission was a little bit similar, that basically to uh, train engineers. Uh, and of course, these engineers were supposed to, uh, to work also in service of the military. But uh, many, of course, also left. And I was also one of those who quickly uh, took another branch towards an academic career. Uh, and other people did as well, by the way, to other careers. So if I get back why, there is no, there's no good answer for the why, I guess things happened so that was all probably also because of the local circumstances of my family and, and uh, stimulating things that uh, in your environment but i think i've got a very good a good technical training over there it was it was pretty pretty high level i think um shouldn't compare it with what we do nowadays because all the people always say that it was much more difficult when we were young uh, uh, but that's not necessarily true of course so this is a little bit how it uh, how it went, and, and basically how I uh, basically got my engineering degree. Okay, but you actually did some research already at the academy. Is that before getting your PhD from? Yeah, well, basically, um, I was uh, I was called back by the academy to uh, for uh, doing an academic career over there. So basically, succeeding one of the the profs. Uh, actually in civil engineering and materials back then. So this is why I already started indeed with research. But uh, as you may know, of course, uh, I've done my PhD in the Netherlands and then, yeah, things happen. I mean, uh, I finally decided to leave Belgium then uh, professionally and then to, to go to the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so now with the, I guess you, 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 you are, I mean, group leader, uh, in, in a department of mechanical engineering, and you, you, your group covers a you know a broad range of topics from experiment side, point, uh, from also modeling, and uh, nowadays you are dealing with you know the hot topics like such as additive manufacturing or meter materials, material for energy, MEMS, etc. Um, I was wondering in, in all these topics, you know, what, what was the balance between maybe industry-driven research and maybe pure curiosity or fundamental science driven research or maybe both for, for each of them? Well, it's a good question, of course, also not, not necessarily a trivial answer. I think in, for many of the, the research funds, we, uh, we relied on industrial support. So we, uh, we have our local, the Dutch Science Foundation, NWO, which basically has a branch in technology but that branch only gives subsidies for research if uh, industry is interested in what you're doing. So already for that branch, which was then more the fundamental part, we needed quite some support from industry. And often that is also cash contribution and in-kind contribution from industry. So we have quite a number of projects in that category still. Uh, we also had and still have projects which are directly financed by industry. So this is the, the type of research where industry really wants to work with you and they don't want the mess around it by uh, created by the science foundations and, and the long waiting times before you get uh, an approval of the grant, of course. So if they want to go fast and they also don't want other partners involved, then they would go for a direct funding. Now, the, uh, let's say the direct funding for my university in research is very limited. So the university supports us, but, but not really in, uh, 
in doing research, we, we need to acquire our funding ourselves. So uh, other than that, of course, there is uh, Europe, uh, where we have the bigger European projects, but also those from the European Research Council, which I would consider as, as the more fundamental ones, because you, uh, you're allowed to do research without any restrictions from industry. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to couple it to industry or to any applications, but you're not tight or bound by it, so you can really freewheel and uh, since we're also engineer, we always try to look for added value in what we're doing and also seek for the applications, even though we're not yet concerned maybe with the, the manufacturing of, for instance, the particular materials and really the, the, the testing thereof up to commercializing it. I think that's where the difference lies. So if I would say how, how many things are fundamental work, I think we did quite some fundamental work. I think we, uh, in, in the views of some others, I think we, we had the reputation that, uh, that there was a lot of fundamental work in, in what we're doing, definitely. But there is also lots of industrial partners behind it, which uh, perhaps many people outside the Netherlands don't see or don't know. Yeah, I guess it's, I'm also asking because um, I also feel like there is a bit of a difference between the topics that are covered by uh, European groups and in the US. Uh, and it might be related to the type of funding behind. So do you feel that maybe in Europe, we are often more constrained by more practical or immediately useful uh, research, whereas maybe in the US, there's maybe more freedom for, or, or taste for risk and adventure that maybe we, we don't have over here? Mm -hmm. no, 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 that's, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, but I don't think we had too many constraints. I think some people of course always complain about the funding landscapes. Honestly, I think we, we, we have a pretty good situation. It's not that bad. And I know that certain Dutch colleagues will, will disagree with me, but they should also look into other countries and to see what the situation is over there. I don't think our system is that bad and basically funding us from all different sides. So, so far we, we survived without uh, too much trouble in acquiring funding for research. And I hope we can keep on doing this. Hey, um, Jimmy Sha uh, has just uh, signed up uh, Jimmy, Jimmy is uh, Editor-in-Chief of uh, EML. Hi, Mark. Hello, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for doing this. This is wonderful. Well, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I it's see awesome. uh, a full yeah. panel of uh, panelists or yeah. wonderful people over here. Uh, Lawrence, I need to check with you. Do you use chat? Um, uh, the chat box you need to open. You are the crucial this, person. I think. Oh no, it's not. It was not. I thought it was open. It was not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I okay. see not. Yeah. You're, you're, okay, that's wonderful. Uh, would you like to introduce your panelists? I know there are still a few more to sign up, but yeah. Even now, yeah. So, please. Sure. I'm just looking at the list to see who is actually in the room. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So I try to gather. Um, people from the, I would say, scale bridging community of people uh, uh, in, in Europe, in the, in the US. So I can see that we have uh, Ricardo Levenson here from uh, Los Alamos National Lab. So I don't know if we can see Ricardo or... We can, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Good morning here. <laughs> good morning, Ricardo. Well, good afternoon here, but... <laughs> Yeah, Mark, uh, last time uh, I attended uh, a talk from you, it was the smallest room in, in the Glasgow conference uh, with the largest attendance. And now we, we, we got a, a bigger room now. Yeah, well, we have to, right? What we did back then was totally impossible in the current COVID circumstances. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, Chalar Oske from Vanderbilt. Who... Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Lawrence. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> nice to see everybody. So I'm going to, because there's a number of them, so I'm going to go through. Uh, so um, so ja Jacob Fish from Colombia. Jacob, I don't know if it's. Yes, hi, uh, Mark. Hi, Jacob. Good to see you again. I hope you're you. enjoying the good Zoom weather. 
All right. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, Kostas Danas from uh, Ecole Polytechnique. Yeah. Uh, so. Hi, Mark. Sorry, I was muted. Hi, <laughs> Kostas. Um, you. Good afternoon. Huh? <laughs> yes, we're the same. I think we're the same time, no? <laughs> <laughs> so Laurence Tenier is here from Nantes. Um, a bit of the. French people yeah. around. Yes, also and, from uh, good afternoon, uh, Mark and everybody. Good morning to the American friends. Um, so we got uh, Leong Han Po from uh, National University of Singapore. Hi, um, it's 9.50 p.m. here, so tonight, uh, everyone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mark. I'm glad that you stay awake for this. <laughs> And then back to the other side of the globe, Oscar Lopez Pamies from uh, UIUC. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Hi, Mark. Hi, Hi, everyone. So it's a bit early for you, no? Oh no, it's, it's okay. yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, Central Time, so uh, ten to nine. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so Pedro Ponte Castaneda from UPenn. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mark. Hello, Pedro. Hello, Mark. I'm actually, uh, I've moved. Um, I'm no longer at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm at the oh, attic my house. So um, hello from uh, Wayne, Pennsylvania. It was a joke, but <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and, and uh, Vikram Deshpande from Cambridge. Hi, Vikram. I think you're muted. Hi, Mark. Hi, Thank you. Uh, and Antoine, that I can reintroduce from Oxford, uh, Antoine Jerusalem, um, for those of you who missed him. I think Hi, this Mark. is. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm around. I'm just somehow up in the air above my college. <laughs> Yeah, this is, I think, uh, the panelists we have. There's a couple maybe who will join us later. Um, but yeah, I think that covers quite a lot of uh, the homogenization community. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a, a lot of insights to share for the discussion after, after the talk. Yeah. So uh, I have another question for Mark, maybe uh, if I still have a bit of time. Um, so it's a question related to the current situation, uh, you know, virtual conferences. And as the, as the president of Euromec, and, you know, part of Euromec goal is to organize a number of conferences and colloquia, and now we do everything online. Do you see that as the future of conferences or that we will keep the habit of having part of the conferences virtual for the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a a question that I guess many people, people are asking themselves whether this will change the situation forever. Uh, honestly, I, I personally hope that we can uh, keep really also physical conferences where we meet people. Uh, I also think that when, when you go to a physical conference, you take the time and you take the time to attend, you take the time to interact with others and, and to really exchange ideas. And what I have noticed that in the virtual situation that people are much more in a hurry, they, they often attend only parts of a conference. And when they think, wow, this is not so interesting, they start to do something else. So people are perhaps only attending, well, in a, in a, in a fractional manner at the conference. And I think it hampers a little bit the interaction with, uh, with the rest of the scientific community. So will it perhaps survive? Yes, maybe. Maybe there will be room for a, uh, a virtual audience that basically cannot afford to join or prefers to, uh, to do it online. I think there's, there's clearly some truth that this may stay. But uh, I would not say that the online conference is supposed to replace the physical conference forever. I think it would not be a good thing to happen. We need to keep seeing each other as well. It's nice to see each other, of course, online and virtually. But uh, we all met before, and I think that matters a lot. If uh, you never met someone, I think it wouldn't be a good way to scientifically interact. It's also to make things, let's say, pleasant and to uh, enjoyable 
we should keep some of the physical stuff that we had before, definitely. And I think most people would, would agree with that. Especially yeah. dinners. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Uh, I will jump, jump on this opportunity to make uh, the announcement of the uh, uh, next EMMC European Mechanics of Materials Conference. So this year has been unfortunately cancelled, the one in Madrid, uh, because of COVID. Uh, but the next one in two years is taking place in Oxford. So Antoine is chairing the conference. Um, so I'm taking the chance to advertise for this wonderful event in two years. Oxford is a great city to visit. So please, well, hopefully we can all go in person and there will be a nice dinner, I'm sure, for Gigan. Okay. <laughs> I think it's very good to make some publicity. It, it, uh, it evolved to a very nice series. Um, so, uh, I mean, Euromac is also very pleased with uh, the EMC, EMMC series. So it's a nice conference. Oh, I can see that uh, Pierre Suquet has joined us. Bonjour, Pierre. <laughs> hey, Lawrence, uh, let me take the opportunity to ask you this question. How many mechanicians at Oxford? So we are lucky to have actually a, a dedicated group of solid mechanics and materials within the engineering department. And I don't know about the exact number. I think we are, is it 12? academics, I would say, in that group. Oh. Um, yeah. But then you would have, you know, mechanics-friendly people in other groups or other departments. So there's a lot of permeability uh, with uh, physics or mathematics uh, colleagues in civil engineering as well. So it's a, it's a good size, yeah. uh, I would say. How large is the engineering at uh, Oxford in total? Huh. Antoine, can you help me on this? Is it six? 60, 70 academics. I'm oh, sure. so 12. I don't want to say something wrong. We're more than that. Uh, more but than it's that? Been, uh, it's been growing quite a lot in the last few years. Uh, I wouldn't commit to give a number, otherwise it's going to fall on me if I make a mistake. Um, <laughs> but it's all about quality, not quantity, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So you're smaller even than us. Wonderful. <laughs> Hopefully it's a higher quality than us as well. Right, all right. So uh, nearly 10 o'clock, maybe Mark, you can um, set up your screen again. And uh, uh, Lawrence, you, uh, you can formally introduce Mark. Sure. Okay, so let's wait a little bit maybe. <laughs> All right, this should work. I think you should see my screen. I hope. Yeah, it seems to be working. Okay, well, then, um, welcome again, everyone, for attending this uh, webinar. Um, so, I'm Laurence Brassard, and I'm going to be leading the discussion. Uh, first, I would like to really thank the EML editors for organizing this wonderful series of webinars that uh, really was a great source of inspiration throughout the lockdown and uh, all this whole COVID situation. So thanks to them for that. And uh, so it's my great pleasure today to introduce Professor Mark Gills uh, from uh, Eindhoven Technology, University of Technology. Um, so I don't think Mark needs a lot of introduction. So he's done a lot of contribution in various areas of solid mechanics, uh, for example, in uh, micro mechanics, uh, damage mechanics, homogenization method. Um, so plasticity theories like dislocation of screen gradient plasticities. So uh, today is gonna talk about uh, homogenization and uh, how we can uh, predict uh, emerging behavior that are non-classical and leading to enriched uh, constitutive uh, laws. So Mark, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Laurence. And uh, also many thanks to the uh, editors of EML for hosting this fantastic webinar and asking me to contribute to it, which is a great pleasure. I've seen some nice contributions already before. So I hope I can also share with you an interesting story. <laughs> 
So the title I've chosen here is uh, on homogenization, and I know that it's, uh, it's a subject that many of you are also working on, but we're actually going to focus here particularly on, on a class of materials that show emergent properties at a microscopic scale. I would uh, definitely like to acknowledge my co-workers, but I'm going to do that in a minute, it's taking a little bit of time for it, because if you think I'm the only one working on this, then of course you're wrong, there are many more. Okay, uh, let me see where I can move on. So this is the outline of what I'm going to present to you. So after the introduction, I will actually spend quite a bit of time on dynamical metamaterials. So typically two classes, the locally resonant acoustic metamaterials, and then a second class where we also include Bragg scattering in a generalized scheme. Once we've done that, I'm going to uh, seek to generalize that or exploit it to totally different phenomena, but using actually exactly the same machinery for thermal and diffusional problems. And once all that is done, we return to mechanical metamaterials, so we leave the dynamics behind, but we keep some memory of what we've done here in order to set up a micromorphic homogenization scheme for mechanical metamaterials. So I'll explain you there what the key feature is, how that works, and show you some examples. And finally, I will conclude. Now, with this outline, you have an idea of what I'm going to tell you. And here you see the long list of co-workers. So the first subject on dynamical metamaterials have been PhD students, postdocs, master students, and faculty colleagues that contributed to this. And I would typically like to acknowledge Eswin Schrithaar, who finished his PhD. I will show quite a lot of his work. And Vavara Kuznetsova, who was strongly involved in this. For the thermal and the diffusion materials, as you can see, that's a collaboration with the Ecole Centrale de Nantes, and Laurent is one of the, uh, the panel members, so he's definitely also to be listed here. The work shown is actually done in the PhD from Abdullah Wassim, and again, Vavara and is involved as well as Thomas Vuzé. In terms of mechanical metamaterials, so which is the third subject, uh, I will show you the work that was mainly done in the PhD of Maksud Amin, and in the postdoc work by Andre Rokos, who is also now a faculty member at our university. Some master students again contributed to it. And in terms of faculty, I definitely need to acknowledge also Ron Peerlings. I will definitely show quite a little of his work as well as Johan, but that's experimental and will not show that much from it. All right, so uh, let's start with it. So first topic is dynamical metamaterials, and we're going to focus on two mechanisms, locally resonant ones and Bragg scattering. I think most of you know what these metamaterials exactly are. So these are special composites and they exhibit a special kind of elastic wave manipulation capability. They're used for noise isolation, acoustic cloaking, super lensing and so forth. The physical principles that basically are behind these materials are actually twofold. So there is property A, which you see here, which typically applies for units in a lattice configuration. These are actually the phononic crystals and their Bragg scattering is actually the physical mechanism. Property B concerns microstructures that have an embedded micro resonator. The key difference between the two is that the first property A, which applies to, for instance, to this material, typically works for wavelengths that are of the same order as the period of the crystal or the periodic structure. Now for the metamaterial property A and B, so for the local resonator, the wavelength can be much larger than actually the particular size of the microstructure. And that's really important if you want to go into the low frequency regime, because in the low frequency regime, local resonance really has something to offer to these kind of materials. So I show you here the example uh, published in Science in 2000, uh, which was experimental work by Liu. Uh, and I will actually come back to that example later on. Now, I will tell you uh, a bit of the work we've done. I will sh not show many details. If you're interested in all the details and all the results, I especially made sheets like this one, which shows you the complete overview of all the literature that you can consult after the presentation if you want to figure out certain details of the talk I'm going to share with you. All right, so first let's start with the property B type materials. So really focus on locally resonant acoustic metamaterials. So interaction between wave and microstructure and local resonance is the working mechanism. So in terms of, well, the meta property, they're often uh, mentioned as the negative effective mass density and or bulk modulus is one of the things that can be measured for these kind of materials. 
So here again is the leader material with the experimental results hmm, that this was shown. And this is a transmission plot where you can clearly see actually an enormous decrease in the transmission coefficient at particular frequencies. And of course, these frequencies, because these correspond with the eigenfrequencies of the vibrations of the particles that are in a local resonance state. The result thereof is actually that you uh, end up end in an evanescent wave in the band gap. That's typically shown here at the bottom. I hope you can see a little bit of the movies where the wave enters on the left, but is unable to propagate to the right. Now, uh, we're going to uh, try to homogenize these kind of materials. And in order to do so, I will start off from our earlier work in computational homogenization. I think many of you now know what computational homogenization is. Huh? So it's an established method that basically solves two boundary value problems and couples them on different scales. Essentially, you're replacing the constitutive equation at the macroscopic scale by a boundary value problem. So normally you have a relation between stress and strain. Well, you will not have a relation now. You'll actually do that by a boundary value problem at a smaller scale. The leading principles here are deformation, volumetric deformation or stress averaging. And very important, the hill mandel condition, which is, in fact, the energetic consistency between the two scales. Now, when is that used? Because most of you will know that it is a, a very expensive method still. It's typically used when you're dealing with a lot of complexity. So complex materials and perhaps combined nonlinearities of different types. Could be physical, could be geometrical or microstructures that are evolving. So basically, when the material is so complex that you cannot simply come up with a constitutive equation that replaces it. Um, I already mentioned it's very expensive, but uh, as it is very expensive, I mean, it still serves the purpose of constructing a reference solution. Of many of the homogenization methods, it's, it's one that is fairly accurate. Yeah. Um, here's a little bit of history on the story. So there's an enormous amount of literature on it. So these are just a few names. It has been done for the standard classical continuum, which is called the first order scheme here, which is classical second order scheme. It has been done for beams, plates, shells, thermomechanical problems, electromechanical cohesive zones, and so forth. So quite a lot of solutions that have been addressed with a computational homogenization scheme. Now, why would we now use such a method for a problem like the one seen here, the locally resonant acoustic metamaterials? Uh, it would be wrong to think that nothing has been done before. There is an enormous amount of literature that basically already does really very good work in capturing these band gaps uh, and also the effective mass and elastic constants. Um, I list here a few methods, so the multiple scattering theory, transfer matrix method, plane wave expansion method, lump mass method, and wavelet method, but there are more than these. I should also uh, mention the asymptotic homogenization methods and variational principles that actually have been outlined to basically do the job. Now, in many of the cases, there's a classical limitation that basically makes it rather difficult, which, which means that you can well homogenize the material, but often you're dealing with infinitely large structures. So not really something that we encounter in engineering, where we always have a finite problem with boundary conditions that basically play a big role in the behavior of the whole component. Linear elasticity is another classical limitation. Periodicity is also mostly used or often used. And the, the loading is often of harmonic nature only. And well, at first glance, you could say, well, computational homogenization doesn't have these restrictions. You could possibly go to finite structures, complex loading, nonlinearity, and non periodicity. So it was good to consider it. So this is what we've done actually in 2013. So setting up a computational homogenization framework. We'll not show many details, but just uh, some core ideas. So here is what, what happens if you, if you do it in a classical way. In a classical way, we will often talk about fluctuations, fluctuations that live at the micro scale. Well, in the classical method, you will average those fluctuations out so that they really don't contribute to the micro scale. For the dynamics that we're considering here, it basically means that all the micro length scales are much smaller than the microscopic length scales. But for the particular problem here, it also implies that the length scales at the micro scale are much smaller than the wavelengths in the different phases of the material. 
And then the RVE is in a steady state and there cannot be any internal vibrations. This is what we call the long wavelength approximation. Now, it's interesting to basically step out this long wavelength approximation and to allow for a little bit more. And this is what we call the relaxed wavelength separation of scales. It typically means that the matrix has a particular characteristic wavelength that is still much larger than the sizes of the microstructure, but the heterogeneities, which are the inclusions and possibly also the shells around them, well, they could be of the same order as the wavelength in that particular phase. Well, if you have such a regime, then it basically will mean that your matrix is in a steady state, but inertia effects and the inclusions are possible. Now, this is a regime where homogenization could still work. If the matrix would also be in a transient state, then of course you cannot homogenize anymore. Huh? So this is why we call this a relaxed separation of scales regime in which there is still some homogenization possible. Now, this is just a sketch of the computational homogenization scheme that is enriched to basically deal with it. Um, so it's actually the classical steam, but on the, the downscaling relations, you also add the velocity from the microscopic scale to the microscopic scale. And in the upscaling relations, you actually add the momentum. And in the computational homogenization scheme, you just naturally compute by solving the initial boundary value problem at the micro scale, what the constitutive coupling between those quantities is. So it's not present in any closed form, you just compute it. So the machinery to do this is, well, I would say roughly similar to the classical machinery with which the other computational homogenization schemes have been developed. So I will not dwell further on this. I just want to show you that this is a method that can work. Um, this is a, a typical result. So the movies, there are some movies at the bottom that could be really slow, also on the top. On the top, you see a wave entering a system at the microscopic scale. And the only thing I want you to notice here is how the amplitude is decreasing as the wave is propagating through the structure. And that's actually what the top movie should show. Some of you may see it, maybe some not. Now at the bottom, you see the vibrational modes. Uh, so where if you could see the movie, you'll see actually that on the right side, the particle is really in this resonant state, is vibrating, whereas actually on the left side, actually the inclusion is actually almost in a steady state and not moving anymore. Um, that's what this shows. And the key question that follows thereafter is, can we go further than this? So within this regime of relaxed scale separation that you see here, we want to homogenize. And homogenize means that you want to replace it with an effective homogeneous continuum that still contains the core properties of the original heterogeneous material. Now, this is what computational homogenization is doing. Huh? So it basically um, does the job, but it actually goes to the solution of an initial boundary value problem. If we now look at what is happening inside that uh, microstructure, you typically see those resonant modes, their vibrations, uh, their actually um, vibrations at the eigenfrequencies of the particular particles. So they're well recognizable modes. If we uh, define a field, which we will call the dynamic microfluctuation field, eta, which as you will see is going to be the amplitude of that particular vibrational mode, then we get actually another degree of freedom that basically says something about the vibrational state of that particular mode within the material. If you now add linearity, which was one of the assumptions used in many of the other methods as well, all of a sudden we can do much simpler than this. We can do a static dynamic decomposition, basically combine that with a serious reduction of the model and end up with closed form homogenized expressions. So in my sketch, it would mean this, it would just mean that all of a sudden this solution to the computational homogenization is no longer needed, but something instead appears, which is actually an equation for the etas. And remember the etas, they're actually the amplitude of the fluctuation fields. And for this problem, the fluctuation fields are the resonance modes. So how does this work? So a little bit of machinery that is actually very similar to what is used in computational homogenization. First, the downscaling relations. So where basically you downscale the macroscopic displacement to the level of a representative volume element with periodic boundary conditions. The Hill-Mendel lemma, which tells us that the average work at the micro scale per unit of volume, 
is equal to its macroscopic counterpart. And once you have made these two assumptions, the upscaling relation follows, which is actually the average relation for the stress and the momentum. So that's an equation that just comes out once you have adopted the hill mendel condition. Now, that's nothing special. That's also what you would encounter in computational homogenization. The RVE problem, which is actually the problem that uh, describes the unit cell, is also a, a regular problem. So we have the balance of momentum on the top and the constitutive equation for the different phases, as well as the rate of momentum. Now, what we typically do in solving this unit cell problem is we're going to discretize it. And we're going to, for instance, use finite elements to solve it. And then we end up in a discretized RVE model, which is actually shown right here. That's actually a solution scheme. If we partition that, into degrees of freedom that live at the boundary, which, which is the place where we actually prescribe our boundary conditions, and the internal degrees of freedom, this system of equations that is seen here would actually look like this, which is just unfolded. The unfolding just means that the only forces that enter the system only live, of course, at the boundary nodes where we apply the boundary conditions. Now, the, the, the advantage of uh, using the linearity now is that we can do a static dynamic decomposition, which is well known in dynamics as the Craig Bampton decomposition. So this goes back to 1968, which tells us that the total response can be seen as a superposition of the quasi-static response plus the internal dynamics. And this is exactly what we're going to do. Huh? We're going to make the split. And for the internal dynamics, we can actually look actually at the vibrational eigenmodes of the material to basically quantify this quantity. So um, for that problem, of course, you solve the eigenvalue problem. Uh, so for the internal dynamics, you can do the modal analysis that basically gives you the eigenmodes. Huh? So you have to solve the corresponding equation. You get the eigenmodes phi and the eigenfrequencies omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3. And the amplitudes, which we will determine later, will be the etas, the eta 1, the eta 2, and the eta 3. So the eigenmodes, they're typically normalized with respect to the mass matrix. And for that reason, the etas can play the role of amplitude thereafter. So this is also a standard modal analysis, which just gives you the eigenmodes and the eigenfrequency. So we have the typical vibrational modes of the material. So the ETAs, we will call them the, the modal amplitudes of the dynamic fluctuations. So what does that mean? It means that if I look at my problem and my total response is split into a quasi-static problem. So in the quasi-static problem, we've done static condensation. So which means it only depends on the prescribed degrees of freedom. And the internal dynamics only depends on the eigenmodes and their amplitudes, eta. So ETAs are now degrees of freedom. They're unknown at this state. We go back to the original discretized system of equation, which is shown here, and we apply the Craig Bampton decomposition on this system. You actually apply a change of variables because it means that the same system of equations is now recast in this format. And the degrees of freedom that are left are actually the amplitudes of the internal vibrations and the prescribed degrees of freedom. So there's an enormous model reduction as well included in setting up this problem. So in the little movies at the, at the bottom, if you manage to see them, you again see the typical eigenmodes that are relevant for this problem. Now, the downscaling relation, because we have degrees of freedom, which are actually the prescribed degrees of freedom of the problem, but those follow from the downscaling relation. So if I look at the downscaling relation here, I can inject that in my discretized system of equation, and that gives me my forces on the right-hand side. The forces on the right-hand side can enter again the upscaling relations that I've shown you earlier, and that allows you to determine the microscopic stress or the rate of momentum. So once you've done that, machinery is almost complete. So what is then the, the, the final result? Well, the, the, the microscopic balance has not changed. But clearly, we see that the top line of this equation is new. It's actually an equation in terms of the etas. So besides the microscopic balance equation, we get actually yeah, a second equation, which is an emergent equation that lives at a microscopic scale, which tells us how the amplitudes evolve. And there are two uh, coupling, a coupling vector and a coupling tensor involved that also enter the constitutive equations. So one sheet back, I've shown you how those 
quantities are being determined? Well, if you make the math, then you actually find out that the constitutive equations for the stress and the momentum will read like this and actually get two emergent contributions. So the standard part is now enriched with a term that is coupled to the, the etas again, whereas actually for the momentum, the same thing applies. So here we have a coupling tensor H and here we have a coupling vector J. And this applies, of course, for all the modes that you insert into the system. You need to select those modes and those modes in the problem that we will look in a second, they're typically selected on the base of the magnitude of these coupling coefficients, J and H. That's actually the way we've done it. So it, it looks like an immersion continuum in which additional quantities need to be resolved at a microscopic scale. We go back to that Liu example, so for which the experiments were done in, in 2000. So here is the mold selection. So you solve the eigenvalue problem and you select molds. And as you can see here, the molds are being selected based on the magnitude of the J coupling vector. So that actually governs which molds are really important for this particular problem. Once you've done that, you can actually set up actually a dispersion spectrum. The dispersion spectrum shows us uh, the different branches, shows us which waves can propagate. So we see two stop bands here. And what you can notice actually that this effective continuum that we actually recover adequately picks up the two stop bands and the dispersion curves, the different branches like the acoustical branch, the acoustic branch, which we see here of this particular new material. So, um, it, it's clear that it works and, and uh, it's an effective continuum that you can basically use to solve boundary value problems with. And that makes it, of course, interesting. I'll show a few, uh, few more examples. So here is the example of a whole array of these Liu resonators. Uh, so the full scale model is being solved here uh, with direct numerical simulations, which means that we discretize everything. And we the, replace this by a continuum, which is almost well a thin line. It's a 1D continuum if you replace it, in which the wave propagates from the left to the right. This is the excitation. And we do that at a frequency of 450 Hertz, which on the previous sheet was right into the stop band. Now, this is what you typically get. Huh? So uh, on the top, you see the DNS solution uh, I hope you can see it. So this is a, a wave that we're actually watching. So we see the, the wave propagating into the system. So the DNS solution, that's the expected solution. The blue solution, that's the, the classical homogenization scheme. And as you can clearly see, the classical homogenization scheme cannot pick up this phenomenon. On the bottom, you actually see the homogenized scheme that includes resonance. And there, of course, well, not of course, but fortunately, the homogenized results falls on top of the DNS results, which again shows that actually the model is doing a very good job. And the computational homogenization is out, which means it all of a sudden becomes a very efficient and fast method because of the linearity of the problem. Um, advantages is that uh, such a continuum can possibly also be used to solve truly in uh, initial boundary value problems for different domains of finite size. Here again, a, a, a static picture at a particular fixed position where we actually see the time evolution. So we're in position dot 42 meters and we see how actually the wave evolves in time. Again, in blue, that's the standard homogenization without resonance and in red, the DNS solution. And on the right, the comparison between DNS and the enriched continuum in which the eta fields play a role. So what it all shows is that that seems to work fairly well. Hmm? Nevertheless, we took we went one step further and we went one step further to also look into the other property that was property A, Bragg scattering, as I mentioned to you. Well, here again, the classical homogenization scheme. So now uh, more cast in the form of viewpoint of, uh, of asymptotic homogenization, maybe. Um, the homogenization operator is a uniform volume average. Localization operator is the standard one up to first order. And we already know that this is the long wavelength approximation, so it doesn't pick up the dispersion and it will not show any evanescent waves. Hmm? I could go one step further, huh, to, uh, which is relevant for high frequency, short wavelengths. Still having a homogenization operator that is still the uniform volume average, but now clearly a higher order asymptotic expansion. Right? 
that has been done in the literature. I know that also Jacob contributed a lot to this. And, and basically, it works already fairly well because it already picks up the acoustic branches of the problem. Huh? So only the higher order correction already has a clear contribution to improving the solution of the problem. Now, in the generalized scheme, we, we want to go one step further by no longer taking this standard volume average. And that is a little bit inspired also by the work of John Willis, where we're going to look at projections of the displacement field on particular functions. These projection functions are actually, you could consider them, we've seen it in the problem before, that the dynamics can be, can be characterized by very particular modes. So if you project your displacement field at the microscale on that mode, and that mode is normalized, you would recover something like the average amplitude of that mode. That's actually what this equation expresses. And the localization uh, problem can then also be expanded to account for the same projection, where you take typically the mode times its magnitude, which will be the new meaning of the microscopic displacement. And of course, we can expand this up also to higher order corrections. So um, that's the starting point. Um, but before we proceed with this, we want to have a, a little bit of a different view of how scales separate here. For that, we look at the Floquet block expansion um, of a function fx, where actually the Floquet block transform is actually in yellow here. And this allows us to basically define a spectral decomposition of what are the fast scales and what are the slow scales. In fact, the yellow term here, the f hat, which is the Fouquet block transform, accounts for the micro part, which is the fast part. Whereas the exponential term here in red accounts for the macroscopic part, which is the slow part. It basically means that that signal fx, function fx, can be decomposed into its microscopic slow part and its microscopic fast part to those different contributions. Well, if we recognize that, then we can define another average than the standard volume average, which is the Floquet block average. And for that, I also refer to the work of Willis. So what is basically done is that if you look again at this function f of x, well, this function f of x, to determine the Floquet block average, we will actually replace the fast micro part here by its unit cell volume average, and then take the same integral to recover the function big F, which is now the microscopic part. We will call this the Floquet block average, but if you recognize it well, you basically apply volume averaging only on this term on the fast microscopic part. That's essentially what you do to define the Floquet block average. Okay, once you've done that, you, you need to go back to the homogenization operator. So what is the homogenization? That is now the Floquet block average, so not the volume average, but the Floquet block average of a particular quantity projected on these yeah, projection functions, but we understood previously that these are typically relevant modes of the problem. So this is what the homogenization operator looks like. So this is a typical example what the macroscopic displacement now becomes. Of course, you need to, to select those projection functions. So for the problem we've just seen, the local resonant metamaterials, these could be, of course, the eigenmodes of the inclusion. You could also go to Fourier series functions in general to basically back out what these projection functions are. Or in all generality, to also, for instance, look at problems where Bragg scattering plays a role, you just compute wave modes at selected prion zone points and include those wave loads in your projection functions. So these are typical ways to select those projection functions. So if we now apply this homogenization operator on our equilibrium equation, we end up with a generalized microscale balance equation that looks like this, which is now formulated into macroscopic quantities, in which we have a macroscopic stress, which is the Floquet block average of the stress. We have an internal reaction which is the Floquet block average applied, of the, applied on the double inner, inner contraction of the stress with the gradient of the projection function. And we have the Floquet block average of the macro momentum that uh, projected again on the projection functions. So these are the three quantities that actually lead to the generalized microscopic balance. Um, the, the localization problem, so going back to the microstructure, of course needs this localization operator ansatz. And here, well, following actually the concepts used in asymptotic homogenization, you can use a higher order expansion to basically set up that problem in a uh, function of the macroscopic 
displacement, but you understood that these are actually more like magnitudes of those projection functions. Well, once you've done that, you of course need to determine those different microscale functions, n0, n1, and n2. And the way this is done is by substituting this ansatz into the full scale equation, which is given right here. And once you've done that, you of course need to ensure that the homogenization operator, which states that the microscopic displacement is the Floquet block average of the projection of u on phi, right? And that for any phi you take on board. Well, if you do this, you, you actually will end up with a set of coupled recursive unit cell problems, a little bit similar as in other higher order asymptotic homogenization schemes, which you have to solve sequentially. And uh, one by one, you will actually determine the N0, the N1, the N2, and so forth. Once you've done that, of course, you can uh, put the result back into the constitutive equations and also work out the constitutive equations. If I look at the complete scheme, so it basically means that, well, I have my unit cell problem. Uh, offline, I compute eigenmodes or at some symmetry points, uh, relevant modes in, uh, in the symmetry points of my pre -un zone. I formulate my homogenization basis with the projection functions, and I solve the unit cell problems, which gives me all these localization functions ni. Thereafter, I can compute the constitutive coefficients, which actually enter the constitutive equations that I've shown you earlier, which expanded would look like this, right? They typically depend on UM, grad UM, second uh, gradient of UM, with the coefficients A0, A1, A2, and so forth for the other relevant quantities. And that's the microscopic equation then of the emergent continuum to solve. And, and that's basically the continuum description of, of this effective continuum that replaces this heterogeneous material, which should work <clears throat> both in the Bragg scattering regime and in the acoustic resonance regime. Now, there's a lot of computational work on here at the top, which is all offline. And once you've done that, you have actually only this to solve. So once you have your homogenized continuum, the analysis at the micro scale should go still pretty fast. Uh, let me show again the example. So I go back to the Lieber material, which actually has both phenomena, where we have again a resonator that shows also Bragg scattering in a periodic arrangement. If we take 25 uh, eigenmodes at the gamma points and we use grad 2 corrections, this is typically what we would find. So here we compare with the block solution, which is actually the, the full solution of the problem. And uh, that allows us to compare how our effective continuum is doing it. So by the way, the block solution can only be used for infinite media, whereas the homogenized solution just tells me what the continuum does and could be used also for finite structures. So 25, that gives a fairly good response close to the points I've taken. So I've been biased. I took uh, all my modes here on the left, and then you see that I get deviations on the right. If I reduce the number to 15 and I increase the order of my corrections, I have somewhat improvements, but not fantastic, I would say. Whereas if I would split the 25 into 20 in the gamma points and five in the M points of the pre zone, then clearly, since I've taken out a few modes here, I have a lot better approximation of the, the, the true dispersion spectrum than I had originally. So it means that, that uh, what well, you can clearly also from the dispersal spectra investigate, is my continuum working properly? Maybe you don't need to get it right everywhere, but at least you want to get it right in the region where you're going to load the material. We have also, but I will not show more on this, I tested this on, uh, on finite domains, really solving boundary value problems with this. The only thing I can tell you here is that the main complexity here is that, well, you end up with many more degrees of freedom in your effective continuum for every mode you have a microscopic displacement, which is the magnitude of that particular model, don't forget. Which means that in the physical problem, you, you excite, you say what the displacement is, but here all of a sudden you have perhaps 25 degrees of freedom in that point, which makes that your boundary conditions are not unique. And that is quite a challenge to seek for the right boundary conditions. So it's also not a completely solved problem, so there's still work to do there. Okay, it brings me to the translation now to uh, the thermal mechanics and the uh, diffusion continua. Um, and I will first start with trouble problems. So here again, the literature that relates to this. So if you want to read more about this, you can find everything into these particular papers. So thermal material. So again, metamaterials used maybe for energy harvesting, flux manipulation, thermal cloaking. Uh, 
um, highly transient, so they typically exhibit high contrast in materials properties and low decay efficiency. So what works is transient computational homogenization. I work here, I refer to the work of Larson and Ramos, but as I pointed out before, it's computationally expensive. And the question is, we've seen before that we can simplify that enormously if the behavior is linear. And the question here was, can we do exactly the same here also for the heat transfer problem? Well, this is the underlying problem. Huh? So on the left, we have the heterogeneous material. We have the micro scale embedded into it, and we want to replace this by an effective continuum. So these are the governing equations for the heat transfer problem. I think you will rec all of you will well recognize this. So micro scale, micro scale, and the uh, Taylor series expansion of the temperature field with periodic boundary conditions on the temperature. So here again, the extended hill mantle condition comes into play. So enforcing this condition allows you to extract averaging relations for the microscopic heat flux and the microscopic internal energy rate. So uh, we can now unleash the same machinery. So if we solve that problem, you would typically set up a discretized microscale equilibrium equation. We uh, look to the problem in a particular scale separation regime, which is similar to the previous case, a relaxed separation of scales. It's the regime in which the time scales of the loading can be comparable of that of the inclusion, but is much larger than that of the matrix. So typically a fast matrix and a slow inclusion, to say it simply. Now, the craig bampton decomposition that we've seen in dynamics can be equally well applied then to the temperature field to split it into its steady state and transient contributions. And if you then do exactly the same machinery if I've illustrated for you for the internal dynamics, so now we'll actually get thermal modes of the material, then we end up with an emergent continuum again. What is the emergent continuum? Well, it has the standard macroscale equilibrium, but it has an extended relation for the microscale heat flux and internal energy rate with additional coefficients. And as you can see, also etas. And the etas, they are again, um, well, quantities that basically govern the micro inertia in this case, but now it's the thermal inertia in this case. The equation as is shown at the bottom is very similar to the one that you've seen in dynamics. And it also means that the whole machinery is very much alike to what you've seen before. It's basically translating uh, wave dynamics to the thermal problem. And hereafter, I'm going to do the same also for diffusion phenomena. A little illustration. So um, this is actually a problem where we actually got a clear contrast between the lambdas of the inclusion and the matrix. So we're definitely in the relaxed scale separation regime. We look at an array of such problems, matrix with inclusions. And we select the thermal modes, and we select the thermal modes here based, again, on the magnitude of the coupling coefficients in the constitutive equations. And once you've done that, you can, again, compare with actually um, transient solutions or finite element transient. That's this one here, which actually the full-blown solution. The quasi-static one, in which you would ignore, actually, the extra contribution of the emergent continuum, which would be the blue line. And then the reduced model, which is actually the emergent continuum, which is the green dashed line that basically falls on top of the finite element transient problem. So what we can see, of course, is that, well, this, this reduced continuum, which has these emergent properties, does performs equally well as the transient problem, but it's about 3,800 times faster. So we're really here at, at the, uh, let's say, at at a point where model reduction and emergent continua become alike. It's a kind of applying model reduction, but if you look at it clearly, it, it actually leads to a kind of an emergent continuum. For the diffusion phenomena, so diffusion phenomena, as, as we can see here, it's a similar problem. So in this case, it's mass transport. So here's the mass balance equation that matters. You can do direct numerical simulations as shown on the top here. Uh, or you could do transient computational homogenization, which is faster, but still expensive, as I've pointed to you a number of times. And even if the homogenization level is very small, then it becomes even very expensive. This is what this graph at the, the bottom right shows. Well, same machinery, so relaxed scale separation. What does it mean? The characteristic time of the matrix is much smaller than the characteristic time of the loading, which can be of equal order as the characteristic time of the inclusion. So again, inclusions are slow and the matrix is fast. 
So typical example for this is like the, uh, the battery problem where the matrix role is played by the electrolyte and the solid active particles, which are slow, which are the inclusions here. So again, a linearity allows to apply quasi-static dynamic decomposition, uh, where the dynamic is now in terms of mass diffusion, which allows us to split the concentrations into its steady state part and a transient part. And the transient part is then again uh, applied by model reduction. So the, the, the steady state contribution can again be obtained by reducing it by static condensation, the gradient reduction, whereas the transient contribution can again be determined by different modes, in this case, diffusional modes, times their amplitudes eta. So again, the additional degrees of freedom have a clear physical meaning in this regard. So if you now look at the problem, so um, the heterogeneous medium is on the left, computational homogenization gives you something that is homogeneous, but is still uh, connected to the microscale at every moment. Whereas pushing it further, you actually end up with an enriched continuum in which the coupling with the microscale is gone, but in which new additional degrees of freedom, the etas, emerge. So the governing equation for the DNS problem is very simple. Eh? It's just uh, the mass transport equation. Computational homogenization needs, of course, the downscaling and upscaling equations as well. And then the enriched continuum, if you go to the machinery, uh, gives you actually coupling terms in which the eta fields are involved in the constitutive equations for the fluxes and for the, uh, the epsilons. And of course, an evolution equations for the etas, as was the case for the thermal problem, as was the case for the dynamics problem. So I think you, you can well recognize that the, the internal dynamics, the thermal problem, the diffusional problem, they're all solved in the same way. And it gives rise to an enriched continuum in which the etas play the role of the amplitudes of the corresponding modes, be it dynamic, thermal, or diffusional. Let me show you also an example for the diffusion case. So here's the heterogeneous material. Um, and it's replaced by a homogeneous one. The amplitude of the concentration that is actually imposed on it varies along the height. And again, you can make a comparison with direct numerical simulations that are computed on the top problem and see whether your effective continuum, which is the enriched continuum, actually stays on top of the DNS simulations, and it does. Right? You can also look into a movie, so I'm not sure whether this will pass well, but if, if it does, then you will recognize that the top simulation is the direct numerical simulation because you can still see the inclusions if you watch well. The, top, the bottom simulation is the computational homogenization solution where you don't see the inclusions anymore, but well, the fields that actually come out are very well comparable. You can also see that the slow inclusions have a clear influence on the, the whole propagation. So it has a, a marked contribution on the overall continuum, which is well captured by the homogenization scheme. OK, um, then let's go on to my third uh, part of the menu, which are the mechanical metamaterials. So we now leave behind the dynamical, thermal, and diffusional ones, and we now go to the mechanical case where you'll notice that we have some lessons learned that carry over here. So again, uh, one sheet with the literature. So if you're interested in, uh, in what we've done here and all the details, you can actually find it back into this list of papers. Um, I hardly need to introduce what these materials are, I think. I mean, uh, these are typically materials that are being used to do funny mechanical things with it. Um, actually, Katja Bertoldi in her webinar on May the 13th already well introduced this. Essentially, we're talking now about materials that show instabilities that form patterns as a result of large deformations, which are associated with an, a clear switch in their microscopic behavior. So if you want, you can say, state that the microstructure changes, changes its conformal state and for that reason has different properties. You see some applications here on the right. Huh? Uh, you have seen that also in the webinar of Katja Bertoldi. I also show some examples here from the Van Hecke Group and Leiden University, which actually shows these materials, the work of uh, Young and co-workers. And at the, the bottom right here, what it mechanically means, it basically means that your mechanical behavior switches abruptly. At the moment that bifurcation kicks in, you get actually a different conformation a different geometry in your microstructure that behaves very differently. That's actually what you've seen here. 
So in a way, it's clear that we, we see deformation modes. So previously we saw, well, dynamical modes, thermal modes, diffusional modes, and here we see actually bifurcation modes into the problem. So what are the challenges? There are actually, uh, well, there are multiple challenges here. So there are patterns. So these patterns arise as a result of geometric instabilities. How to deal with this in homogenization? There is asymmetry between tension and compression. Uh, shear bands occur, localization occur, and boundary effects occur. So many things to say about this. What I will now focus on mainly is the top one in blue, that is the appearance of patterns and how that can be incorporated in the homogenization scheme. So um, typically we're dealing with problems that show multiple patterns in space and time. So in the middle problem, you see a cruciform specimen that is in the biaxial uh, state, biaxial compression. And what happens there is that in multiple points in space, you get different patterns and hence also a locally different constitutive behavior. So all of this depends on the local biaxiality, so the ratio of the two normal strain quantities. So it's what we typically call mixing of patterns in a single specimen. A pattern one could arise, which is a shear pattern. A pattern two, the butterfly pattern. Or a pattern three, the flower-like pattern. And all of that depends on the biaxiality ratios, whether they're larger than one, smaller than one, or equal to one. Now, here again, the question is, well, if this is my mechanical metamaterial showing this peculiar behavior, can I replace this by an effective continuum? That's what homogenization is all about. Now, we need a reference solution here. And what is the reference solution for this problem? Well, for the, for the problem like this one, we also need to recognize that we do not really know the exact position of that microstructure. If we consider it as a material, you'll make structures with it, and you will not account for where exactly these holes are positioned relative to the structure. Well, that justifies to construct homogenized solutions as reference solutions based on ensemble averaging. What that means is that if you want to um, look at the continuum, well, you can possibly shift the microstructure in the domain in various ways and take the ensemble average of all different shifted positions as the reference solution. Uh, you can also look into literature, has been done often in the past, of course, to construct these kind of solutions. Now, here comes the real trick. And the real trick is actually in the kinematical ansatz that is adopted. It's inspired, of course, by what you've seen in the other homogenization frameworks. But what we'll essentially do is split the kinematics. We'll split the kinematics into its standard slow scale mean part and then the spatially correlated fields. And the spatially correlated fields, they're clearly modes in this case, for instance, bifurcation modes, times their amplitudes. And these quantities only depend on the slow scales. So that's the big X, right? Slow scale, slow scale, whereas actually the mode can actually fluctuate well in, in, uh, at a small scale. For now, this still depends on the position zeta of the microstructure. And whatever is not captured in these two contributions in a typical standard may is the remaining microfluctuation field that is the unresolved part. Hmm? So here you see it in the, in the, if you wouldn't grasp what I was exactly saying, so here you see it in a picture. So this is actually the displacement field that has actually its mean field contribution, which is shown here, and then the contribution of the different modes. That's actually the decomposition that we're actually adopting here in the micromorphic scheme. So this is the kinematical ansatz, that's step one. In step two, we are going to make an approximation thereof at the local RVE scheme, and for that, it's, it's quite a little bit of math behind here, but you also take into account the relative positions of points within the RVE that arise due to the shift factor zeta, which you see here. Well, if you do that and you work it out, you can basically get rid of the zeta, but in return, it gives you gradients of V0 and gradients of VI to get a first order approximation of what this kinematical answer means in an RVE. So this is the expanded form of the Taylor series expansion of the displacement field of a point within an RVE. Next, we construct the uh, ensemble averaged energy. And uh, to make it clear, so we're applying this on hyperelastic materials. Uh, actually, the hyperelastic material proposed by Katja Bertoldi herself, for which she also determined the material parameters. And for that reason, we're actually focusing actually on the energy and the minimization thereof. So, the ensemble averaged energy is being determined, 
and we do the minimization process to basically back out the solution. So the whole minimization of that energy plus a constrained potential, which involves Lagrange multipliers, I'll detail that on the next sheet, allows you to obtain the solution. And what is the solution? That's of course the displacement field, the mean field, plus the amplitudes of the different modes present in the microstructure. And the remaining part, of course, is then the remaining unresolved fluctuation field. So um, solution procedure is the energy minimization here. But as I mentioned, so there are constraints acting on that fluctuation field W. Uh, it's the remaining field, which basically means it should contain all the information that is not yet contained in the other fields. And for that reason, you have to add a number of orthogonality conditions to make sure that that microfluctuation field is unique. So make sure that it's orthogonal to all the other terms present here. So the contributions of these terms, which are the modes. Huh? So it's order has to be orthogonal to each of the modes, but also the modes times the, the position vector x, as you could see in the kinematical expansion on the previous sheets. So that makes sure that actually the W field becomes unique. Next to that, the periodicity is enforced on the microfluctuation field, which is the standard equation shown here at the bottom. Well, the first variation of the energy then allows us to basically extract the governing equations. So looking at the variation of V0, we basically get these equations as the equilibrium equations, but also a second one, which is the result of the variations of the amplitudes VI. So a second equilibrium equation on top of the standard one, and of course, also the solution problem for the microfluctuation fields in which the Lagrange multipliers enforcing periodicity and orthogonality play a role. So what is clear here is that we get additional balance equations at the microscopic scale. That's actually one of the important things to remark. Um, well, there are new quantities, new field variables, and that also means these field variables, they must be determined. That's also a result of the whole machinery. So you get the standard stress quantity, which is just the volume average of the small scale stress, and the additional quantities, which is the scalar and vectoral uh, quantity, which are, again, volume averages, but of the stress projected on the gradients of the modes, or the stress projected on the modes themselves, plus this additional contribution. So this is actually the mathematical machinery, which gives rise to these three quantities that enter these governing equations. So again, we're dealing with an emergent continuum that basically takes on board this extra kinematic role of these modes. So um, in the multiscale computational scheme, it then looks like this. So we have a macroscopic problem. We have the standard balance equation, the additional balance equation, the quantities that basically have to be transferred from the macro scale to the micro scale is the standard gradient of the mean field displacement, the amplitudes of the modes, and the gradients thereof. Once that's done, the micro scale problem can be solved, and the corresponding stress quantities and stiffnesses are returned back to the microscopic scale. So whenever these modes are zero, which means there is no pattern, you will recover a standard Fe squared, which is standard computational homogenization. Um, like always, we solve for the fluctuation fields locally at each Gauss integration point. So the, the micromorphic scheme only comes into action as soon as one of these amplitudes becomes non-zero. Otherwise, it's a regular continuum. So you could state that these quantities, Vi, these fields, they activate, in fact, the micromorphic scheme. I will actually show now an example here of on a hexagonal stacking of holes, which was published in Extreme Mechanics Letters, which is important to remark since this is an EML webinar. Um, first of all, we're going to look at the temporal pattern switching. So two different states of biaxiality. So a gamma equal so just above one and a biaxiality just below one. So we start off from the same reference configuration on the left. It devolves an initial pattern one here and here a different pattern two. And if you go further, this one goes to uh, pattern three prime and also an other pattern three prime for the other biaxiality case. And here on the right, you can also see that the mechanical performance is of course drastically changing upon pattern formation. So this is typically what comes out. Huh? So uh, you see that uh, I show here the magnitudes of the different fields. So on the top right, you get actually the standard slow displacement field, the mean field displacement. So the, the one component and the two component. 
that's standard. I think more interesting are the three at the bottom here, which are the amplitudes of the different modes, so the V1, V2, and V3, where they respectively correspond with the patterns that we have seen earlier. So a pattern is in fact a linear combination of modes. Huh? So you'll always see a contribution of V1. So this is actually the dominant one. This is the one that is shown here, which is constant in this case for this uh, infinite periodic stacking here. Uh, later on, the V1 amplitude will become larger and the V3 one will become more negative and so will the V2 one, which picks up this later pattern three prime. If I go to the other biaxiality ratio, and now the one at the bottom is actually displayed here, I again see a clear contribution, minus dot two two from mod one, a negative one from mod two, and a positive one from mod three. And the linear combination of these three modes that again gives the pattern that has been observed in the different magniform state. Now, more interesting even is the spatial mixing of patterns like in this cruciform specimen. So here we see the, the cruciform with an equibiaxial compression. So it shows both pattern one, pattern two, and pattern three. And again, you can see that the three patterns are in fact linear combination of modes. And you see the coefficients of the linear combination listed in this table. It's not really important, just to remember their linear combinations. Now, I'm gonna show this in this movie huh, because that's the best way to illustrate it. So I'll let it play for a moment so that I, you can hopefully see it. So again, on the top, we see the X and the Y component of the mean field displacement. Yeah. At the bottom, we see the magnitude of mode one, magnitude of mode two, and magnitude of mode three. And we see where this magnitude develops spatially in the cruciform specimen. And in order to interpret this in pattern, you will have to make the linear combination of the different modes to identify which pattern is actually visible there. But it shows that basically you can really deal with spatial mixing of patterns in a finite structure and the time evolution of those patterns. And this is actually what the whole micromorphic scheme was precisely after with a continuum that is very efficient in doing so. That's actually the key result of this analysis. I think I'm approaching the end of my hour, and I think that's also a good moment to, uh, to conclude. Huh? So uh, I will not repeat what I've said, but I want to perhaps give some take home messages here. So on the dynamical metamaterials, I think the, the open challenge is, is really still on the finite size boundary value problems and the issue of the boundary conditions. So we can homogenize the, the continuum and the bulk response, but we still need to see how to deal more properly with the boundaries. Uh, Nonlinear effects, I point here to two papers uh, that is joint work with uh, Priscilla Silva, Valentina Zega, and Michael Leamy, and Vavara again and myself, uh, which also give very peculiar effects in which I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And that ties up, of course, with non-reciprocal behavior, subharmonic band gaps, which was something we typically achieved exploiting nonlinear effects, tunability, and so forth. For the mechanical and metamaterials, I mean, functional grading is really a challenge. Non-periodic microstructures, because we cannot really make them so perfect. And so we should also should deal with that non-periodicity and uh, also further exploit, exploit microscale model reduction. All challenges that can uh, go forward. I think the key message of uh, all the methods I've shown to you is that, well, basically, if you recognize that fluctuations uh, inside a material are sometimes correlated, show a pattern, then you can basically construct uh, enriched continua that deal with those fluctuation modes, assign an amplitude to them, and compute these amplitudes in that enriched continuum. I think that was actually the red line through the entire story. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, of course, I'm, I'm open for, for questions, so thank you. Hey, Mark. Can we ask you to um, unshare your screen so sure. we can see all the panelists? Wonderful. Yeah. Lawrence, you can start. Great. Thank you very much for the very nice talk, uh, Mark. Uh, it's actually quite impressive to see all the progress that has been made in this homogenization field in, in not so many years, actually, right? Because it's been like less than 10 years that uh, like the first work on dynamic homogenization that you done. Yeah, so, we, we the first one was, on, it was basically 2013. That was with Kim Fung. Yeah. Maybe yeah. in the audience, uh, you never know. 
uh, and the the remainder of the work was actually done in the past five six years so it was we, well you asked me questions about funding so we got funding for it which was that uh, the ERC grant that helped a lot in doing this kind of work because of course it has quite a little bit of fundamental nature mm -hmm. yes yeah no this, this is a, this is really impressive and it forms a really well coherent uh, work so yeah so um, I propose we start by maybe taking questions from uh, the panelists, that is people that are uh, on the screen at the moment. And then uh, we will also, of course, take questions from the, the broader audience. So uh, I think we already have a few questions. So maybe I'll take them in order I see them. So uh, I'll take the first one. So uh, maybe uh, Jamal Bazaran, maybe you want to go first? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, hi, Mark. I am Jamal Vassar. I'm from University at Buffalo. That was an excellent presentation. I have a question. So you impose a displacement boundary condition between the inclusion and the matrix. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say the, the, it was fully tied. So there was displacement continuity, yes. Yeah. So do you have to have a mechanism to prevent the energy reflection? you can transfer the displacement, but that will not transfer the energy because it is the same thing that we use in molecular dynamics and finite element uh, course, you know, handshake point. Yeah, you probably noticed that the rubber shell has an important role to play. Huh? So it's an inclusion with a rubber shell uh, that actually is embedded into the matrix. And if the rubber shell is not there, then basically you kill off a lot of the mechanism and you only keep one of the properties and kill off the other. So for the local resonance to take place, you need the rubber shell. And the rubber shell is actually a very compliant material that precisely plays the role of the interface, allowing the particle to vibrate. Uh, whereas the matrix, like I said, is more or less in a steady state. So the rubber shell is important. I see. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, then I'm going to ask uh, Brian Cox. Hello, Mark. Lovely to see you again. Good to um, see you. Oh, oh, that's you know, very deep and profound talk. Thank you very much. It was, it was great. Uh, what a survey. So I, I've got a, a question that may be a little far out there, and I'm just curious to know how far out it is, uh, whether it's tractable. So um, could you consider for a moment, please, a population of living cells, uh, mm. which are numerous. There might be millions of them. Uh, busily going about, for example, some process in development. And, and each of those cells, uh, along with being some kind of a me mechanical entity, is active. Mm -hmm. So it can do stuff like change its shape or proliferate. Mm -hmm. It's essentially an, a non-periodic system, and it's probably also stochastic. Mm -hmm. So if you put those three challenges together, something that's non-periodic, stochastic, and active. Do you see a prospect for homogenization techniques that, um, that could be developed? Well, a few things that you, you need to consider, of course, like I, I insisted quite a bit on, on uh, you need to be in the right regime to do homogenization. Mm -hmm. So definitely we, we need to look into the physics of that problem, whether it allows for homogenization at all. Certain problems can simply not be homogenized because the whole system is continuously in a transient state and there's no way you can homogenize it. So if, if, you are, if there is a regime that is relevant in which you can basically say, well, this is a condition where we could homogenize, then, then it might be possible again under the condition that there, is, there needs to be a, a property that carries over to, to, the, uh, to a higher scale. So if you're talking about active cells, then, then I'm looking for, is there concerted motion between the cells? Is there, is there a pattern? Is there a, a shared action between the cells that basically can serve as a, a totally different kind of pattern, but something that could serve in, in such a homogenization, it's extended homogenization scheme. This is definitely what you have to look for. Now on the active part, that's a, of course, that's a more puzzling question. It's also a relevant question, I would say for the active metamaterials, because I mean, in the future, um, metamaterials need to be active. Uh, that's also what, what uh, the big dream is. And we also would like to homogenize active metamaterials, which in a, a kind of way have an internal energy source, of course. I think, I think it's possible. I think I'm not pessimistic that this would not be possible, but uh, 
we need to, uh, to do the job completely from scratch again to see that we capture it all right. But I think the two conditions are, is there a relevant homogenization regime? That's one. And the second, uh, is, there, is there in the, the whole dynamics at the micro scale, really a property that carries over to the macro scale? Because if everything is uh, chaotic and stochastic and, and so forth, then it might not be that trivial to say which is the, the property that carries over. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dennis, hi. <laughs> hi, Laurence. Hi, Mark. Uh, <laughs> great overview talk. Very nice to see all the work summarized. Um, I, I have a twofold question that's a tiny bit selfish. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of recent work on phase transforming metamaterials, which seems to me like the perfect marriage of the two things you talked about, or two of the three things you talked about, where you have structures that transform between multiple stable configurations that is inherently nonlinear and it's dynamic phenomenon. So in this case, you have to go into the nonlinear regime, but it's very strongly nonlinear because the potentials are non-convex in this case. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious to what extent this can be used. and if I could throw on, tag on a second question, that is when we make these metamaterials, one of the things that emerges naturally are imperfections all over the place that do have impact on the emergent macroscopic response. So partly connected to the previous question, if you have periodicity, but you do have imperfections on top of that, to what extent would you say these schemes can be applied? Well, uh, well, first going to the, the first problem, the question of nonlinearity, of course, uh, if, if, if a problem comes strongly nonlinear, then it's clear that whatever pattern or mode you're looking at, and that can also be a transformed state, as you're pointing out, um, this may change considerably when the behavior is very nonlinear. As far as I can see it, this is, is going to be a big price to pay, because even if you would use such a homogenized scheme, you would have to update the modes. So whereas, of course, and for practical purposes, it's easier to compute them once and for all and then to do an engineering calculation with it. If it's strongly nonlinear, that will not be possible. So the, the modes will need to be updated. Of course, one can also look for, is there also a way to update them in a homogenized setting such that the, the nonlinear interactions can be translated also into an update of the modes. I think it, but that hasn't been done as far as I know, but that would definitely perhaps be an interesting uh, way to explore. The second point was, what was again the second point you raised? If you break the periodicity by imperfection. So you're yeah. still periodic, but there are significant imperfections that can affect the response, especially for acoustic metamaterials or so. This, this happens all the time. Well, in that case, of course, well, now the, as long as the system is periodic, you can do unit cell computations. And it's a little bit like also in uh, heterogeneous materials. If imperfections start to be a big hole and the, the stochastics plays a big hole, you will need to look at much more larger volumes and look at a representative volume element, a, a larger domain that hopefully captures enough of the imperfections and the statistics thereof such that you can get a representative view. And possibly you will also need to extend it with the stochastic method to also know what is the, 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 the mean field, what is the possible uh, fluctuation around it due to the stochastical variations within the microstructure. So uh, yeah, I think it, it's going to be a price to pay for that, for sure. On the other hand, uh, I think it's perhaps what we need, because I mean, many of the existing methods uh, overly rely on periodicity. So perhaps for that precise reason, we need to also seek for the methods that step off periodicity. Uh, and the second thing is that are applicable to finite structures, huh? because any engineering structure we make is finite. and still the boundary conditions that go along with it is really a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we have a question from uh, Oscar. Right. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, the, the first one, I think, has to do with the first or second slide you had. You had a specimen that looked like a cube uh, with about 10 unit cells in it. So we know that for linear properties like elasticity in the static context. Um, uh, if you have separation of length scales, that is, I don't know, four or five times the micro to the macro, then essentially you quickly converge to, to the homogenized response. Now that you're looking at these more uh, complicated properties, I was wondering if you have a, uh, an idea of quantitatively, what is the cutoff in separation of length scales in which you can effectively assume that you can homogenize? Well, yeah, well, to, of course, that's, I, we made it simple by saying qualitative, huh? so that 
that the wavelength of the the wavelength of the matrix should be still considerably larger than than the characteristic size of the heterogeneities. The question is, what is considerably larger? It, it's I think it mainly means that the fields at the level of such a unit cell uh, of in whether they may need to be approximately constant. And, and I think if that's the case, well, when is that the case? I mean, maybe if it's ten times larger or so. So that the wavelength in the matrix is ten, at least 10 times larger than the characteristic size of the unit cell, I think that's some kind of a lower bound. But of course you can do an error analysis and, and because you can compare with DNS type calculations and, and really see in the relaxed scale separation regime, how, when are you off? So really get closer and closer and closer to the, the boundaries of what is homogenizable and see when, when you're off. And I think we've done it a number of times and, and we're still surprised that uh, you can go pretty far. I mean, perhaps further than you would guess. So this is why uh, if I say 10, I think it would probably still give a, a fairly good approximation. It also depends on what you're happy with as an engineer. Right? I, you saw me comparing the DNS results with the homogenized results. So in the curves I've shown you, they were pretty much on top of each other. If you go further, then, uh, then probably it starts to deviate more. And, and when is it still acceptable for you and when not? And that's, of course, for you to judge. Huh? OK. Yeah. All right, and my second question has to do with the, the last topic. So uh, you show this uh, boundary value problem uh, with the hexagonal distribution of circles. So in the context of finite deformations, uh, you may have many solutions uh, of equilibrium because you bifurcate a lot. Now, the method that you develop is picking up uh, uh, one of those bifurcated solutions. Uh, can you comment on, on which one is it picking up? Well, the, the ones that uh, basically it all depends on the number of modes that you take on board. So what you would typically do is to, uh, I have not shown that sheet, but we can look at the second uh, variation of the, uh, the energy functional and then basically extract the whole stiffness matrix of the complete system which allows us to do uh, a bifurcation analysis and also identify the modes that appear in the system. Still, the number of modes can be too large and, and you, uh, you need to select a, a limited number of modes. Uh, I've shown you a number of ways to do this, typically looking at, at the, the coupling coefficients in the constitutive equations to, to look at which is the important mode or not. For the, uh, the bifurcation problem, you can, of course, typically also look at reference solutions, which are the ones that typically appear and, and pick those one out. The, the point is also that depending on the loading that you apply, you can trigger very different ones. Huh? So um, if you want to use the continuum for all possible loading conditions, you will probably need plenty of modes to, to deal with that in all generality. So I think to, to really exploit it for engineering purposes, we also need to couple the, uh, the mode selection criteria to uh, the particular loading regime that the material is driven into. Because if, if not, the, the too many modes will, of course, make the problem uh, more difficult to solve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Antoine had a question. Hi, Mark. Uh, well, thanks a lot. It's very nice to see how this, this is evolving. I have a question. Uh, it's regarding the, the temporal stability of your skins on, on the first part in particular. Uh, is there any kind of restriction on the time stepping that you have to deal with when you look at those fast oscillation versus the macroscopic ones? Uh, is it fully independent? Um, well, let's say it's the first scheme. In, in the end, of course, you end up with a completely unhitched continuum. So it basically means you only have equations left at the macroscopic scale. Um, let's say, of course, time stepping restrictions apply, but uh, as far as I can remember, they are, they are not very different than the ones that are commonly used. Uh, in terms of time stepping at the micro scale versus micro scale, so the, the micro scale computations. Uh, there are separate boundary value problems if you want to, and they're then computed at the offline stage. And there too, I guess the usual restrictions apply in doing so. But for that reason, I do not see an immediate coupling between uh, the ones you use because it's often related to the, yeah, the discretization scheme that you're adopting, eh? both in space and time, uh, whether that's appropriate for the system that you're studying. Okay, because uh, uh, it's, it's my ignorance speaking here. Because if, if you have a slow-moving uh, macroscopic uh, wave, let's say, uh, 
And it might trigger within an element, obviously, some resonance uh, at the micro scale level. Uh, but that might involve uh, triggering the resonance for the entire uh, macroscopic object, whereas technically, you know, it would take some time to propagate through the microscopic uh, uh, object. Yeah, maybe but I'm not clear here, yeah, but I'm, this, is, this is confusing me a bit, I guess. But I think this, this relates to, let's say, the, the typical discretization uh, restrictions that you need to respect in, in any wave propagation problem. Huh? So to basically select the, the proper space and time scale, so the proper discretization and the time scale to basically discretize your system uh, to avoid all kinds of spurious phenomena. Yeah? So uh, that is the course, same as, okay. All right. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Um, we had the uh, Lixing Zhao next. Thank you very much, Professor, for the giving us this very uh, wonderful talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm Lixing from Paris, uh, Institute of Physics, the Global Paris. Um, so I have a very simple question here. So I'm just wondering, you know. Um, when we do this uh, homogenization, so what kind of material, you know, what kind of problem may be not suitable to do the homogenization? When we do this homogenization, um, you know, for some material or, you know, for example, the localization of physic, uh, and, you know, plastic, plastic, plastic deformation, maybe we will ignore some main feature or the we smooth the some main um, critical characteristics something you know so I just wondering what kind of situation is not suitable. Thank you. Can you hear it? Not a clear question. So, so what is what is not suitable? So uh, what exactly can you maybe make it a little more, more clear? It's not clear to me what you're after. So you see for the um, elastic deformation. So. Yeah, it's easy, you know, it's suitable, it's easier to do, not easier, but it's suitable to do this homogenization. It's good, we, we can make it more homogeneous than we use the equation to calculate, to, to calculate stress and deformation. It's very useful, very helpful. But maybe for the some, you know, some plastic deformation is some kind of cracking fracture, maybe it's not suitable. So I just wondering for this, since this kind of situation, probably we um, ignored or sometimes we smooth some main feature over there. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure whether, whether I will um, answer properly. Uh, I, I understand that you were uh, asking more or less what, what the restrictions are of the schemes that I have presented. So when they can be used and when not. Huh? So uh, yeah. the not suitable, I would understand as when it may not be used. So. Um, not the, the, the starting point of the computational homogeneous, computational homogeneous machinery would allow you to go into the nonlinear regime, but you need continuous updates, as I just also replied to Dennis's question. Uh, it's only when you assume linearity, and linearity often also goes along with elasticity, only then you can actually push the scheme so far that you get really these emergent continuum that start to be very efficient. Uh, like I pointed out, so the also, it means that there is a restriction that you cannot go out of that regime again because then other phenomena will take place. So I think elasticity is, is really, so, and linearity are two of the properties that are strongly exploited. Now for the mechanical metamaterials, we went to hyperelasticity, as you may have observed. And so we had elasticity in the, the wave propagation problems and hyperelasticity for the mechanical metamaterials. If you would ask me, well, can I do this when also damage and cracking and plasticity and so forth is placed? I would say no. I mean, uh, definitely not at the moment. I don't think, I also think it would perhaps not be of great interest. These are materials which you, which you develop like 90% uh, like of the engineering applications are made with materials that are supposed to remain elastic for their whole lifetime. I think these kind of applications for these kind of materials fall into that same category. You want to use them because of the peculiar emergent properties that they deliver, and uh, they should then remain in that elastic regime for their whole lifetime. Uh, that's actually how you should look at it. So I think uh, are there really applications in which you can exploit plasticity uh, damage? Maybe in the mechanical materials, I can imagine that you could exploit plasticity 
but if it's not recoverable, then I think it's also not a very interesting meta material anymore. So I think this is this is maybe an answer to your question. I think this is where it it, res, it restricts us. But from a practical point of view, and then I mean really from the perspective of applications, I don't think it's a big restriction. This is also how you want to use these materials. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from uh, Louise Vasconcelos. Hi, 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 everyone. Hi, Professor Gears. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a, a PhD at, at Purdue University, and uh, this is field is uh, relatively new to me. So my question may be more naive than the, uh, everyone else's. Uh, I, I think you showed very quickly uh, some results that you have for diffusion, for a diffusion problem, and you mentioned that there is some cases where the direct uh, numerical solution can be less expensive than the homogenized solution. I think. Uh, Maybe I, that's what I understood from that slide. So I, my question is, where is this additional cost, computational cost coming from? Since this is new to me, that's, yeah. yeah. yeah so in that, at that point, I was comparing DNS with transient, transient computational homogenization. Mm -hmm. So in computational homogenization, you're solving many RVE type problems. So small volumes in every integration point of your macro domain. So when does it become more expensive? It's typically when you start to over homogenize. It's what we call the, the homogenization level, uh, typically, um, which, which is the size of the volume, if you would add it up, that you're still solving. So if I'm small, solving a small volume at the micro volume, and it's 10 times larger than the, smaller than the microscopic domain in which, and read element in which that uh, lives, then it would typically have a ratio of 10. So the smaller that ratio becomes, at some point, I'm actually computing uh, as much of the space as I'm doing in the DNS simulation. And if that's the case, then uh, the homogenization framework actually becomes inefficient. So uh, you're supposed to use it with a considerable scale separation. So if you use it under conditions where the, rest, the homogenizability is very small, then it becomes very expensive. So this was actually the key message that I, I wanted to, to tell you typically in regimes where the, the microstructure is not that small compared to the microstructure, then it becomes relatively expensive compared to DNS. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zhigang, you had a question too. Hi, I'm Mario. Wonderful talk, wonderfully deep. I need to read your papers. I have only superficial questions. So, so far from what I knew. Um, so uh, I, I want to confirm what I heard from previous answer, question and answer. The method can be used for nonlinear problems, right? Uh, not directly the way I presented to you. Let's say I have to be a little bit precise. So the mechanical metamaterials, uh, yeah. of course, you go into it's nonlinear hyperelasticity. Of course, you already have a uh, nonlinear behavior, but still hyperelastic. If it's strongly nonlinear, then it means that the, the bifurcation modes that I've shown you, they will actually change during loading. Yeah, so yeah. they will distort. And, and if that happens, you'll basically need to iterate in your nonlinear scheme to also update these. Yeah. All right. Another superficial question I haven't heard people asking. Right now, in both your scheme, lower scheme and upper scheme, are, are continuum mechanics. Are, so of course we know a lot of physics. Uh, they have a uh, similar partial differential equations, or uh, let's say quantum or whatever. Um, does your scheme also allow different sets of partial differential equations? Well, well yes, yeah, it happened as well. If you could, if you could see yeah. that basically the, the last problem yeah. had uh, microscopic balance equations which were expanded uh, relative to the microscale. The microscale only had the standard balance equation, whereas the microscale had additional balance equations. So in some cases, you're right, the balance equation is the same, but there was an additional equation, which was in fact an ODE, not a PDE, but an ODE, an evolution equation that came next to it. Yeah. Uh, but the last problem, we also got PDEs next to the standard PDE at the microscopic scale. So it depends on the problem. Sometimes you just get an ODE, sometimes a PDE, but you always get an additional equation at the macro scale. Yeah. Another, uh, my last uh, superficial question, just to see how somebody like me might be able to use it. For example, 
are, so many of your examples are about the periodic structures. For example, if uh, I want to think about, I guess, uh, to some extent, largely unsolved problem, you know this, is uh, polymer, uh, especially when interchain interaction is more complex. But uh, each polymer chain and another polymer chains are similar. They're just not periodic. Mm -hmm. Will this kind of scheme homogenization uh, help? Well, I guess computational homogenization as such, we, we've shown that in the past is not restricted by periodicity and yeah. uh, in con the contradiction to many other methods. Uh, it, it's some, sometimes it, it exploits what we call weak periodicity. It, it sometimes assumes periodicity only in your immediate uh, neighborhood, but not at a larger distance. Um, I think if it's not periodic, you mentioned polymer chain, so that's really a small scale problem. So I think there's something that could be uh, even, even addressed um, at, at the scale that we have considered. But in general, in all generality, if a problem becomes non-periodic, then we need to look at volume elements that also are non-periodic, that get an irregular stacking. Of course, this was done for the standard mechanical behavior already a number of times, so that people make complex representative volume elements that were no longer periodic, uh, possibly also with boundary conditions that basically do no longer enforce periodicity. Huh? So uh, I think that is technically possible, uh, but of course the whole machinery needs to be updated for that. Huh? Thank you. Uh, Chalar has a question. Thank you. Uh, th Mark, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I think I'm really glad to see that you're pushing the uh, boundaries of homogenization in various different fronts. I, uh, I wanted to get your um, ideas and perspectives a little bit from the material and structural design uh, standpoint. So um, there, there has been quite a few, for example, for metamaterials. I think these ideas extend to the other aspects of your problem. Uh, but uh, some of the computationally designed acoustic or optical metamaterials that have been uh, identified during some of the projects that are going on in the, uh, the US turned out to be not very successful when they start to uh, actually implement it. And of course, some of those uh, issues are related to the existing defects and uh, things uh, of that nature, uh, like uh, Dennis mentioned. Uh, the other area is that the, the computing accuracy uh, within a given design space when we go beyond what we have already uh, validated. So I wanted to get your opinion about uh, whether you had you guys have uh, performed accuracy analysis of uh, the model predictions within a, a range of material properties uh, in terms of, for example, if you're looking at uh, multi-material systems, range of material contrasts, and also uh, your views about perhaps uh, thinking about a priori error estimators to understand how well the materials do in spaces or subspaces of, uh, of uh, material parameters where, uh, you know, where you haven't really probed yet. And also perhaps uh, ideas about the automated accuracy control, which may help you, especially when it comes to reduced order models where the machinery becomes much more complex. Yeah. Of course, yeah, it's an interesting question. So, um, that there are two uh, parts of the story. So on the one hand, uh, you can compare with real experiments. You, Maybe I'll comment on that in a minute, where people uh, designed the meta material, then made it, and tested, and are disappointed afterwards. So I'll come back to that in a minute. So that's comparing it with real life, or comparing it with what we would call the numerical reference. And uh, often when I showed DNS type calculations, that was to get some kind of numerical reference, so that that you know that basically if I now throw out all the homogenization assumptions I've made, and I solve the same problem in a very expensive way then I will also get a solution and I would consider that as the reference solution. So whenever I would want to assess errors, I would probably assess the error with my numerical reference solution because I want to know what the error of my method is, right? What, uh, what the approximation is that my, my method has involved. Uh, that is another error than the one uh, when we're talking about when we're, well, comparing that um, numerically ideal material with the real life engineered material in its application, because then of course, another error comes into play. Um, I think that, uh, that one of the things that definitely um, has a clear effect on what people have 
analyzed on, uh, on materials numerically and that doesn't match well with reality is this uh, infinite medium assumption. So people have been designing um, the materials based on their bulk type properties in an infinite medium as if boundaries do not exist. This is typically what you would do with, with using the block type analysis. Then you uh, examine the material in an infinite medium. Of course, this is a condition that any enriched continuum should met, but there is more. And because if you're going to engineer something, if you're going to test the material, you make a finite piece of that material and no longer an infinite medium. And this is where I think most of my questions are still are at that point. As soon as you make a finite medium, uh, then boundaries play an important role. And uh, we are focusing a lot on the homogenization of maybe yeah, the bulk, uh, and perhaps we're not yet enough concerned on what the role of the boundary is, and, and also the role of the way the material is, is actually, well, positioned at the boundary. I mentioned in one of the examples that the relative positioning of the material at the boundaries could also play a role, because we, we apply a macroscopic boundary condition, and uh, well, if that happens to be in the matrix, or there is the particle sitting at the boundary, that may mean something very different for the behavior of the material. So the, the way boundary effects, and also in the finite medium, all the deflections from the boundaries, and by the way, because if I would look at a wave propagation problem in a finite domain, I would get lots of reflections induced by those boundaries, which would probably give me a very different picture of how the metamaterial performs. And along with that comes all the imperfections you were mentioning. It is, it is not periodic. It's uh, probably lots of processing faults into it and so forth. And in that sense, we, I also recognize the, the comment you made that uh, many of the designs underperform relative to the numerical predictions. Um, well, I think maybe going further into finite domain analysis rather than in could, could help in understanding where perhaps the, the approaches fall short to directly translate from bulk to a finite structure, because I think there is one of the, the key problems that, that plays a role here. I do not know whether I answered everything, but at least uh, some parts of it. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Leong Hen. Hi, Mark. Thank yeah, you for the very nice talk. You know, I, as I mentioned, uh, this is a uh, uh, at night in Singapore. So thank you for the very nice uh, bedtime story. Now I'm, I'm referring to your talk on uh, mechanical metal materials. And this is a slight extension of what uh, Oscar asked you earlier on, on the uh, capturing this macroscopic bifurcation uh, deformation uh, correctly. And which you also uh, replied earlier that of course in general, you if you have more uh, deformation modes, uh, these are eigen modes, then of course the, the, the solution is going to be more accurate. Of course, it comes at this uh, computational cost. Now specifically for your examples that we have shown, you have used three modes, right? For, for those uh, the examples that we've shown. Mm -hmm. And, and I, if I recall correctly, in your decompositions of the displacement field, you have a, a, a something like a micro fluctuation field, which also seems like a, a correction term. So, so now my question is, you know, let, let's say if you, you, you are only using two modes, now will that correction term be sufficient or adequate enough to capture the missing modes in your solution? So, so how important is, is it to, to, or how will you determine the, the appropriate number of modes to introduce into your, your, your model since you have that correction term? Yeah. Well, the, the, the correction term you're talking about, which is the, what I also call the remaining microfluctuation field, huh? uh, is, uh, is indeed a complementary part because it should account for all the fluctuations that were not yet there in, uh, let's say, the, the mean field, the displacement field, or the ones that are captured through the modes. Um, to make sure that basically it, it, uh, it is complementary, those orthogonality conditions were enforced. And to make sure that W contains parts of the kinematics that was not yet contained in the other terms. It is true that if you miss in, uh, a mode, it will naturally land in the W field. Huh? And if you would set up a numerical procedure where you continuously compute the W field explicitly, well, you could do that. But then, of course, you do have, again, a very expensive field. So what we're also trying to find is whether um, the solution procedure for the W field can be as simple as possible. The simpler it is, 
uh, then uh, the more efficient the whole method becomes. Um, of course, if I would apply a first order uh, computational homogenization scheme, all the modes would be in my fluctuation field. Huh? So uh, it, it, would, it would also give you a solution. And you can also apply a second order computational homogenization scheme to it. Uh, and they would also get a certain degree of approximation, the one better than the other, of course. Um, the whole point is, is which one most efficiently captures the overall macroscopic performance in the most efficient manner. Now, having said that, the question of uh, the number of moles yeah, remains a question that, uh, that has no clear and unique answer, I think. Also because of what I mentioned earlier, it also depends on how you load the material. So uh, depending on how you load it, you can really activate certain modes that for other loaded conditions are totally irrelevant. So for any analysis, you would still have to look at what are the spectrum of, what is my spectrum of modes uh, at hand, and, and then to look for a criterion that makes the selection procedure efficient. So for instance, by looking uh, at the total energy included, whether you can recover the patterns observed, uh, and of course, sometimes using reference simulations to see whether it's complete enough. Huh? In the schemes, the schemes for uh, the dynamics, of course, we explicitly looked at the, the values of the coupling coefficients in the, in the constitutive equations to see when these are significant, it means that these modes will contribute a lot. Huh? So these are all methods to basically uh, probe the relevance of the modes. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Carlos Azua Gonzalez. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mark, for the talk. Uh, my question is more uh, like an advice. Uh, I am a PhD student in the UK. Previously, I was in the Netherlands, in Delft, but then I, I decided to move to the UK. We are working with some computational homogenization schemes for concrete modeling. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to combine micromechanical theories for defects in solids with some energetic constraints plus some um, embedded strong discontinuity methods for deformation localization. And we're having nightmares with uh, tangent operators under the quasi-static regime. So we don't get true quadratic convergence rate. I don't know if, if you have some advice on, on how to, you know, like how to improve convergence because the more complex things you, you add into your computational homogenization scheme, it becomes much more difficult to really develop through chain rules, the, the tangent operators. Yeah, well, I understand that you're looking into a problem that has localization and, and uh, that evolved to discontinuities, which is uh, a kind of a, an ultimate challenge for a homogenization method, huh? uh, because it's a part of it can be something that localizes will almost always violate separation of scales. So it's something that does not allow for a trivial homogenization. We have, we have done some work in the past on uh, computational homogenization in the presence of discontinuities. And it basically means that the homogenization is typically done along the discontinuity, but not across the discontinuity. Because across the discontinuity, you need to fully resolve the presence of that discontinuity. And that means quite a bit for the homogenization scheme because it means that uh, um, using volume elements with periodicity conditions, that, that's, that doesn't work because it, that has biased localization. So you need to make sure that there's also a full kinematic coupling between the volume element and the embedded discontinuity at a microscopic scale because that's exactly what accounts for the full resolution of the localized kinematics. So, one cannot homogenize across a discontinuity. There is no separation of scales in that direction. The homogenization is typically working then along the discontinuity. So I think it's, a, it's the, one of the most difficult homogenization problems maybe that you're trying to do. Um, I don't know how you did it. Huh? Um, we have done it for uh, embedded discontinuities also of the XFAM type in the past. Uh, I, I fully recognize that it's a complex problem. Uh, so uh, also our formulation, in my view, was rather complex. But I do not recognize the lack of convergence and uh, the, the other numerical problems that, uh, that you're mentioning. So I do not know exactly how you've done it. But uh, maybe you could, uh, you could have a good look on, on uh, what exactly you've done and whether that is, well, whether what you're doing is allowed to do in terms of homogenization conditions. Uh, 
yeah, so basically what we have been doing is we have obtained some closed form solution from the micromechanical defects into the material points, but at the localized, the truly localized zone, we have some uh, damage informed solutions. So it, it simplifies the, the, the schemes. So we, we do get some good convergence for small elements being cracked, but as soon as the ratio of cracked elements to uncracked elements increases, then because we get some type of some kind of truncations or approximations based on central differences, then we keep losing the the rate of convergence. Mm. So now, I understand yeah. you mentioned that you have kind of a closed form expression for for uh, if I understand you properly for how the defects affect the micro scale yeah. behavior. Um, a cohesive zone is also something like a closed form expression that does a similar job. Huh? So you have probably have something different, but uh, you need to be aware of, of one thing that many, many people doing uh, simulations with multiple cohesive zones will also know is that at some point, the, the introduction of softening response at various locations within the material, because that's essentially what is happening, may render the overall problem non-convex. And, and of course, when that happens, uh, it means that there are many bifurcation states in, inside the material. And that's, of course, for any Newton method, well, uh, problematic. So if you're really running into a problem that has many bifurcation states because of the non-convexity that you introduced to your closed form equations, then you should perhaps look at other numerical solvers to, uh, to see whether they do better, whether they're really uh, applicable for the problem of the type you're investigating. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the advice. So we had a question from Costas, but he has to go soon. So Costas, are you yeah, still with us? Yeah, it's, it's afternoon here, so we have to pick up the kids from the school. So, <laughs> so um, uh, it's going to be a, a very quick one. Uh, I have seen mostly 2D calculations. Uh, how far have you been able to go to 3D calculations so with these uh, kind of things? And then the second thing is uh, in, the, in the last examples where it's like this micromorphic, I mean, you can imagine having very, um, uh, very uh, strong gradients due to boundaries that there are. So then what is the range of, what is the number of unit cells that you need to use in order to have a, a proper uh, gradient theory sufficient? Or uh, suppose you don't have many unit cells. Uh, how would you deal? I, I don't know if it was clear. What I, what I mean is that you have some gradient due to some geometry at the boundaries, right? Of your uh, of your structure, let's say, and then you're trying to solve the you're trying to put some homogenized problem there, but in order to do that, you need to have sufficiently high number of unit cells in order to do that. Yeah, but, uh, what if you don't have so many unit cells? What is the what is the boundary between using these kind of gradient theories and using just the full scale calculation? And if you can merge these two in a structure, because I imagine you can have like a whole or some kind of a, of, a, of a defect, a structural defect that around this, uh, this point, you might need to do a full scale calculation. And then it's like what the, this uh, coarse graining uh, feature is and... Uh... Yeah, no, I understand. So uh, for the first question is, is uh, towards 3D calculations. Uh, I explicitly say towards. Um, we have been mainly working on the, the method development. Huh? So uh, the extracting the corresponding continuum and so forth. I guess none of what we've done is really restricted to 3D, but of course, we all realize that going to 3D will always blow up the complexity. Uh, it, uh, that's for sure the case here. So uh, I think it will become uh, considerably more complex to 3D. Uh, we haven't really done um, well, real 3D analysis. So I think uh, so far, I mean, we established like the framework and the theory and well, the, the extension to 3D is still to be tested. On the other question, which I think is a relevant one uh, related to homogenization in general, I think a part of the answer is always hidden in the, the kinematic Taylor series expansion, which is adopted at the level of the RVE, or in this case, the unit cell. I mean, you may have seen that, for instance, and I now refer to the, the last scheme, that the Taylor series expansion uh, has, for instance, the V1 fields and the gradient of the V1 fields and is truncated thereafter. 
And what that means is that if you truncate after that term, that means that the grad V1 field must be more or less constant at the level of the unit cell. It means that the V1 field can evolve linearly over that unit cell. So if you're dealing with a field that evolves linearly with respect to that unit cell, that's fine. If the variation is much stronger than that, then it's no longer appropriate. Then the gradient theory cannot be used for that particular unit cell because it will be not more than just linear. And perhaps you need to act, take higher order terms on board to properly deal with that. So often, I guess, the, the part of the answer is often hitting the kinematical ansatz and the truncation of the Taylor series, how far you can go. And I, I do know this probably point out that people go often too far in this even the standard homogenization scheme uh, allows for linear displacement so as soon as the displacement profile is quadratic in that volume element you're also going too far so uh, that that's that holds in the continuum but that also holds at the boundaries whenever there are important gradients at the boundaries you need to check whether the conditions that you basically assumed from the start are still met Okay, thanks a lot. Um, next, we have a question from Deng Zhang. Hi, Professor Gears. Thanks a lot for the nice talk. And this is Teng Zhang from Syracuse University. And I have two questions related to your mechanical metamaterials. Actually, the first one is a direct follow up of the 3D case. Like suppose we have a thin film made by the uh, uh, by the metal material. When you compress, you will have buckling out of plane and also like a shape change of unit cell. Like it's possible to develop an effective continuous theory that can describe the coupling between bending and in plane deformation. That's my first question. The second question is a, a follow-up question similar to Danny's uh, question that if you, uh, so if you have uh, like a multi-stable inside your unit cell, most specifically at the same loading condition, you have like a, your unit cell can have two or more states. Is it possible that to include this uh, like, uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, the discrete uh, states in the, uh, so in the theory? Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, let's go to the first question, which is uh, a whole of the out of plane in 3D. So first of all, to talk about the buckling phenomena, uh, I have not shown these, but we, we have done a uh, local versus global buckling analysis in plane, uh, which was an in plane analysis. And uh, there you can show that it actually still works fairly well and that the homogenized continuum picks it up adequately. Now, if I go to the out-of-plane bending, uh, where I guess you were referring to, then I think you, you definitely need to extend the framework because you need to, to incorporate the, the out-of-plane deformation as well. So in this case, that was not included. So that would require a full 3D um, extension, I guess. I, I don't see a problem. Uh, I think it's, it's possible, but of course it gets more complex and more extended. So. Uh, but um, well, reflecting on it, I don't see an immediate bottleneck why that would not work. Yeah, so then the other point, if I understand you properly, is like, and uh, can, can I um, dynamically adapt, uh, I translate it and uh, tell me if that's not what you meant, but can I dynamically and discreetly adapt the basis of modes that I take on board during my analysis, which means I can start with one, uh, then perhaps add two more. If the loading conditions change, I might uh, decide to take uh, two other modes on board. Uh, I think yeah, one can perhaps uh, work on the framework in that sense. But um, of course, if you would throw out modes and take other modes on board, you, you're always dealing with discontinuous steps. So your numerical procedures will need to be adapted to properly deal with this because you're actually changing the kinematical ansatz each time. So then you cannot rely on continuity thereof, um, at least during the loading. So definitely you will, uh, will need to take that into account in your numerical scheme, but I, I don't think it's, it's impossible. I think uh, that a model reduction that is done as well. Huh? So you, you could also look at this problem as a kind of, it's not very different as, as a model reduction problem in which one needs to select modes as well and in which there are procedures to do that also dynamically and discreetly and change it adaptively during loading. Okay, thank you. 
Sulin, you had a question. Sulin Zhang, are you still around? Sulin, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Mark, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, thanks uh, for learning, uh, for, uh, for the sharing the session. So I'm Sulin uh, Zhang from uh, Penn State. I'm one of the uh, associate, associate editors for EML. So um, I, I see uh, in your uh, numerical methods, you have upscale, you have a downscale, and then in the standard multi scaling uh, uh, coupling, uh, usually people design a interface or handshake region and ensure smooth message passing from one scale to another, right? Uh, but it seems that you must take a different way. This homogenization must take a different way. You have different modes, and then you superimpose these modes together to get a, 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 a complete solution for the field. If this is so, how would they ensure the smooth transition between the interface? How do you ensure the message passing uh, between the interface, between the scales? Mm, I don't know where whether I'm going to give you a good answer to, to that question. So the information passing is, uh, is, is, is rather simple in the sense that it, it really concerns the basic quantities that live at the microscopic scale, and uh, only those, and, and not the constitutive equations themselves. And so you just pass the kinematics. And so the average kinematics is passed from the micro to the micro scale. So we're not passing uh, the, the history. So we're not dealing here with history-dependent behavior. So it's just the kinematics that goes from macro to micro. And, uh, and sometimes that's enriched kinematics, as I've shown to you. It tells you something on the smooth fields, but also something on the, the different modes that are developing. And the whole micro scale analysis performs the mechanical well, state at the micro scale. It averages it out and it gives this information back. So I do not really see a real issue in the interface between the micro and the macro scale. So what, what we make sure of is that the, those downscaling and upscaling relations, that they meet certain uh, principles. And, and this is what, for instance, why I said also in the very beginning, this extended hill mendel condition is really an important one. I think it's one of the leading principles to make sure that your interface, as you call it, is energetically consistent. Because if it is not, then you have relations, upscaling, downscaling relations that do not respect certain leading principles between the two scales. If one would have, for one reason or another, other such leading principles, I think one could also consider uh, setting up or reconsidering the upscaling and downscaling relations to make sure that they, well, respect that as well. So, for us, in the mechanics, it's just the, the hill manual condition or in its extended form when we're talking about thermal or diffusion problems. Great, thank you. Uh, Ricardo, you had a question for a long, long time. Yeah, thank you, Lorenz. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, a very nice uh, talk. Um, I, I have uh, two questions, uh, like most of people. Um, uh, you, you, you show the three, three cases, uh, the, the wave propagation, the, the thermal, and the, the diffusion uh, problems. Uh, in the wave propagation problem, it was clear that your eigen modes uh, were, were, were um, the longitudinal uh, re resonance, and then you have torsional resonance. Uh, my first question is, uh, can you provide uh, a similar physical uh, meaning of the eigen modes uh, in the in the other two cases, the thermal and diffusional. Uh, I am I am guessing, for instance, in the in the diffusional case, uh, sometimes you have diffusional process that uh, involve a, a volume change. Uh, in another cases, it's uh, in, uh, th those uh, diffusional case involve shear. I'm wondering if uh, the, if there is a clear cut way of explaining explaining uh, what these eigen modes in the in the thermal and diffusional problems are and my my second question is uh, in your one of the your last uh, slides you you show the um, uh, an analysis of the uh, partition of the different uh, uh, you, you have three modes uh, and um, you, you 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 show the some plots of uh, how those uh, mixed modes were distributed uh, and uh, what I remember is that uh, you, you, you were uh, getting uh, in the third uh, mode, uh, 
you were getting a, a, a partition that was not, didn't have a four-fold four symmetry, while your, your cruciform problem should have, a, a, should, should have that uh, 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 symmetry, if I understand correctly. So can you, if you remember that, that uh, mm -hmm. result, can you, can you explain why you are not getting the, the symmetry that it is expected? Yeah. Well, I'll try to. So uh, the first, first, the first question. So you you asked. Uh, listen, the, the dynamical modes. Uh, it's clear what they are. The thermal modes. Uh, what are they exactly? That's the kind of question you're asking. Um, of course, you should look at the, the the thermal problem is also a kind of a wave propagation problem, and, uh, and and it's not so surprising that that wave also can have multiple modes. And the, the, so the thermal modes are actually modes connected with that wave propagation problem. And it's like, like for the dynamic case, if you, you can indeed excite, excite the bipolar mode and everything depends on, on how, how the heat flux that you basically prescribe onto the problem, how that basically enters the system. And, and depending on how the heat flux enters the system, you can trigger one of these modes. Um, and that's actually what the, the thermal mode really stands for, I guess. I know it is a little bit less intuitive than the dynamical, but mathematically it's not very different. So you, the mathematical meaning is, is pretty much comparable. Also, by the way, for the diffusional problems, this is essentially what it reflects. Um, it's true, I guess, that also in the mold selection procedures, uh, one can indeed try to rationalize that which particular loading configurations will trigger which modes. Um, but of course, it depends also on the complexity of the geometry of the component that you're analyzing, because for a, a planar uh, component with straight edges, it can be still uh, with, with uh, well, normal loading. It is rather simple to rationalize, but in 3D structures with curved shapes and boundaries, it becomes rather complex to rationalize which modes will be triggered, also just for the, the dynamics problem. So maybe that is a, somewhat of an answer to the first question. Then the second question was, uh, I guess you referred to the, the, the field V3 of the third mode where you said it was not having that, uh, the expected symmetry, but you should be careful, I guess, by looking at uh, one particular uh, field only, because what the kinematic tells you, of course, is that uh, it's always a summation of, of the, the four contributions. So you have to look at the V1 times the phi1 field, the V2 times the I2 field and the V3 times the phi tree field. So, and it's actually, you can only rationalize on, on the symmetry conditions on the, the sum of those, not on the individual contributions. So I think it would be a little bit uh, going too far to expect that symmetry from each of the individual contributions. So it's the sum that needs to, to, to get that symmetry that the cruciform specimen is actually showing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay. So there's a couple of uh, panel members who haven't had the chance to speak. I don't know if Pierre or John, uh, you have uh, uh, comments or you want to contribute in some sort. <laughs> I think you're muted, but... Um... It's my turn? I, I, I think oh. I'm in now. I think oh, I'm in yeah, now. Here you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mark. I'm... I'm glad at least I've caught the tail end of this. I don't know if you know, but I'm on holiday and I was out and I missed your lecture and have just been listening to the questions. So okay. I can't make a fool of myself by asking you a stupid question at this time. And all I can do is to say that I will check out your lecture on YouTube, um, the, the recorded version. And that's right. really the best I can do today. So, yeah. uh, well, with that, <laughs> I'll shut up again. On the other hand, John, there are, there are a few people uh, like you that already know a big part of it because having been on the PhD committee of the yeah, first, I, you probably know more than all the other people that listen to the story. <laughs> yes, but I, I would, would have needed to revise it by listening to what you had to say again. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so Pierre, you wish to say something? You can say just hi. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. <laughs> you're pushing me. Um, hello, Mark, and congratulations for, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, I have a selfish question. As you know, um, we are doing some reduce order modeling of, uh, but for nonlinear problems and static problems. So I'm, I'm trying to understand 
what you, what you call an enriched uh, continuum. Um, and it seems to me that um, you get these additional variables, these additional degrees of freedom, which are the amplitudes and the modes, and their gradient, uh, because you're uh, taking into account inertia effect, mm -hmm. at least in the first part of your talk. In the last part of your talk, since you're dealing with uh, instability problems, you could, you could consider the same problems without inertia. And uh, so my question is, uh, so you, you, you're taking into account the buckling modes uh, at the microscopic level, um, if I understand correctly, of course. That's correct. Uh, but but then, then I don't see why you need the gradients of uh, the... Uh, additional degrees of freedom, except if you go to higher order in the expansion. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take the gradients of this, uh, of this modes. If, uh, if, if you look at the, what is the cruciform specimen, then for instance, and you look at the, what the spatial result is of the direct numerical simulation, then you will actually see that the, the patterns, they evolve also spatially. They get distorted uh, as you move in space at a microscopic scale. And uh, the fact that the V1 field is allowed to be linear at the level of our unit cell precisely accounts for this uh, spatial variation. If you would enforce it to be constant, well, you could do this, but I think that it basically would mean that your, your cells probably need to be even much finer compared to your microscopic scale. So I think it just allows us to consider a problem with somewhat larger cells because we allow for that extra variation at the level of the unit cell. It's maybe comparable to when you can use second, first or second order homogenization. I think it's comparable because there too, you take this extra term on board and it allows you to go further in terms of uh, size effects. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, and Laurent also. Laurent? I was sorry. <laughs> I thought I was uh, on because I was using the space bar, but it doesn't work apparently. Anyway, so uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. As I said, uh, I'm a bit more familiar with the first two parts, so I maybe have a question on the third part. And it's, it's coming back to one of the questions which was asked before. And let's say my impression is that. Uh, the fact that the modes or the patterns of deformation that you introduce are reversible or not is not so important. Maybe as long as you would have monotonic loading. So you talk about applications, but okay, I could think of applications, for example, in uh, energy absorption devices where maybe you would need to go to the unloading phase. And so the, the question is the, the following. I mean, is it really, a, crucial to that the, the patterns are reversible or could you apply this with, uh, for example, plasticity, but with the idea that you don't need to go and look at the unloading phase? Mm -hmm. I think it largely depends on what you want to do with the material. If, if for instance, well, the, this class of metamaterials are sometimes also being considered as, uh, as to be used if in, uh, in artificial mustards, if you add actuators actually to the system. And then of course you want it to be reversible. You want to store energy in it, but you also want to release that energy and you want to recover the shape so that you can use it multiple times. So if the application is really after that, then I think the reversibility is important. If you're looking on the other hand at maybe, well, uh, once in a time energy absorption application like crash, crash problems where you want to absorb the energy once and for all, then of course reversibility is not important. So it depends strongly, I guess, what you want to do with the material and what, what the application is, whether reversibility or not matters. Okay, thanks. And then maybe I had just another question. Uh, uh, maybe you already answered this a little bit, but uh, in terms of instability patterns, uh, how can you uh, detect, let's say, uh, the cases where you would miss some uh, long range interactions between the localizations, instabilities, uh, how, in other words, how 
can you be sure that the, the unit cell that you take is uh, large enough to capture all, uh, I mean, the range of interactions of the... Yes, yeah. Of course, of the, yeah. It, it's true that, that, uh, that you need to look, I mean, the bifurcation can indeed uh, happen at the level of a single unit cell, but also double or three unit cells. So, it's, so the typical wavelength of the bifurcation can span multiple cells. That's absolutely true. And I think before you decide on choosing the unit cell, you need indeed need to know what the, the characteristic preferred bifurcation modes of the material of interest are. So whether you can do it with a two by two, whether that is enough, or whether you really need to go to a system that is somewhat larger to also capture the long wavelength bifurcation modes, which indeed exist. Huh? So, uh, but sometimes they're almost never triggered. So it all depends on, uh, on how the system behaves. So, there is no, no magic solution in this regard than uh, first inspecting how does this material behave and then basically select the unit cell which you think it, it covers the wide span of what is encountered in all the loading conditions that you have looked upon. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from uh, Hamad. Who doesn't uh, have a camera, I think. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thanks to Professor Diers for uh, your great talks. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a camera. However, you haven't lost too much. Uh, well, actually, I have a two question. The first one is about the um, uh, homogenization uh, of, uh, for example, and we have an RVE with uh, cohesive elements. Uh, so with some bunch of grains with cohesive uh, interface. And um, after some uh, time steps, we faced uh, losing stability, Ooh. yeah? So we cannot use homogenization anymore. Am I right? Uh, I mean, classical homogenization. At that point, um. can we say yeah, it, it, it depends on what uh, you say, we're losing stability, but the question is what, what kind of stability is lost? I mean, if, the, if an RVE becomes globally unstable, then it means it's going to localize, and then standard homogenization no longer applies. That's clear. Now, on the other hand, it, it can be locally unstable, and if it's a problem with plenty of cohesive zones, then uh, it's you, you can run into a problem that it becomes numerically unstable. And the numerical instability is then due to the, prime, the fact that the problem you're solving has multiple bifurcated states uh, because it, the underlying problem becomes non-convex. And that is something else than basically the global stability that you're facing in, uh, in case of localization. So I think it depends a lot on, on, on the problem that you're, you're confronted with. I mean, people have been doing localization with lots of cohesive zones but you can only do it as long as it be, remains globally stable, then, uh, then you can do it. And otherwise, I mean, you really enter into the localization issues where we had a question on before. Uh, so is there any way to, uh, to distinguish between global uh, losing of ellipticity and local losing of ellipticity? Uh, well, of course, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Let's let's simplify the problem. Yeah, uh, uh, we don't have a macroscopic problem. We only have a R an RVE as a, a sample of a microstructure. Only one RVE, and we load it, and we reach to an unstability or losing ellipticity that uh, our solver cannot go farther. At that point, can we say that uh, uh, that this is the failure point of also a, our problem, a macroscopic problem. Well, uh, our material, let's say material, is uh, consider tensile test. We have a failure uh, surface for each material. We can we can imagine a failure surface. A unit. We have a unidirectional test, and uh, we get one of those points of the failure surface by by by, by only single test. Yes. So here we also have a computational lab. We apply the load to our micro to our microstructure, our RVE and our RVE lose elasticity. So can we say at that point of load, uh, this is a, a point of our failure surface? Well, the way the way I understand your explanation. 
that the RVE becomes completely unstable. And if that happens, that basically means that the corresponding uh, eigenvalues of your stiffness matrix well shows negative values well if that happens then it basically means that localization kicks in so it starts to localize your rve that does not yet immediately mean that your microscopic problem becomes unstable it means that there is a onset of localization you could look at it as a crack that nucleates at your microscopic scale, or at least a localization that initiates at your microscopic scale. But as soon as that happens, your coupling with the scales is no longer appropriate, as I explained before. So. Uh, I, I, I thank you very much. And can I ask a question, my second question? Uh, it, it's about your uh, second, your first uh, presentation. Um, in your first presentation, you compared a dynamic wave uh, in DNS model with classic homogenization model. So, uh, well, actually, I expected much more, uh, uh, let's say, dynamic response in your presentation was so smooth. But I expected much more, you know, high, I expected higher frequency in the wave of the DNS solution because we have a inclusion there and we wave uh, faces this inclusion it's back reflected back so we have a lot of uh, complex wave propagation there but the wave you showed there it was very smooth so i was wondering maybe you have done some post processing on the data or no what uh, if i remember well so what what you saw was actually the the average what was happening on average in a cross section of that sample so because you can of course look at a local point but since you're replacing the heterogeneous continuum by an equivalent homogeneous one you can you should comp make the dns computation and then of course you need to average such that it becomes comparable with that continuum it makes no point to look on top of the inclusion and to compare that with the homogenized solution you want to make sure that the average behavior is captured adequately so in the DNS computations, you of course have cross-sectional averaging involved. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Hussein. We cannot hear you. No. Are you muted or? Okay, maybe we'll take uh, then Trisha first and then we'll go back to Hussein after. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gears. It's, it was an excellent talk. So my uh, question is uh, pretty much I'm asking for a clarification if I understood correctly. So in your talk, uh, especially in the first part where you were doing the thermal and the diffusion analysis. So you mentioned that the accuracy of the homogenized scheme will depend on the choice of the mode sets. And I think there are some follow-up questions also. So uh, if the domain is unknown at the beginning and we don't know, like the loading condition was not analyzed beforehand, so we don't have any idea. Are you suggesting that we have to do uh, DNS to get the idea of the important modes first? That's, of course, that, that well, DNS can always steer you, but of course what you can also do is first take take as much modes on board as possible. And then of course, beauty are the, the magnitudes of those modes. And if the magnitudes uh, remain very small, it basically means that the contribution of that mode is negligible. And then you can adaptively remove it again. So if you would set up an adaptive scheme that basically allows for well, removing modes and taking extra modes on board dynamically, then of course, there's a better way to deal with it. But it, it requires, of course, to to take more modes on board initially, evaluate their contributions, and then remove them again. So that's the adaptivity that you would need to add to. And uh, if we do that adaptive scheme, uh, does it penalize the computational uh, time and effort? Like, is, does sure, it become? I think it will become more expensive, definitely, yeah, because your number of degrees of freedom of your continuum yeah. problem, really, if you take uh, 50 modes, that basically, that's what, that means 50 degrees of freedom. Huh? Don't forget that. Huh? So the number of degrees of freedom 
is a lot more than what we usually have is we consider displacements only. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, let's see if uh, Hussein is back. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, so for the problem. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Professor Gears. Uh, I have a question on uh, time scales. So you have two time scales at a macroscopic level and uh, at a microscopic level. Is there any limitation uh, about the ratio of the time scales? Well, there is. I mean, it's what I call the relaxed scale separation regime. So uh, where I, well, again, people ask what is the, the exact number. I can't say what the exact number is, but uh, we have typically a loading time scale, which relates to, uh, well, the, the rate of loading versus the amplitude of loading. Uh, we have characteristic times for the inclusion. We have characteristic times for the matrix. So in the relaxed scale uh, separation regime, uh, we want to make sure that basically the time of loading can be comparable to that of the inclusion, characteristics time, but the inclusion must be very slow then. And the matrix is very fast. Now, if you then ask me what is slow, what is fast, that remains what is the exact number. I find that hard to say. So my, my, I still think that what you can try to do is, of course, uh, push it to the limit and see and compare it with DNS calculations and see when you're really at the, the limit of, of what your relaxed scale separation regime allows. I think with uh, something like 10, you're safe, I think. So, but it's more like a, a, a number that comes out of my thick thumb. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have another question. Uh, so uh, in this case, how did you choose the time stepping then according to the micro scale? The, the time stepping, so like the, the solution of the different problems are, are separate. So the time stepping schemes was also more or less asked before uh, are done separately at micro scale and micro scale and basically follows the standard restrictions for uh, propagating waves and, and make sure that you use the, the proper time scale for the particular discretization of interest. Uh, and sorry for the third question, did you ever think to, uh, or do you think that is it possible to apply this scheme to uh, long range interactions, for example, if you have a magnetic spheres inside? Uh, maybe, maybe, yes. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I said before that, uh, that uh, we, we really need to think further on, on uh, thinking about active metamaterials that indeed means that you need fields that activate the material. Yeah. And in that case, I think uh, magnetic fields are really definitely one of the candidates to consider. And uh, I won't say that it's applicable in the way I've presented it to you. It will need to be extended, but I'm, I'm not pessimistic that uh, we can find ways to do this and to also take magnetic actuation on board. But well, it probably requires another PhD student. Huh? <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Mehran. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to Professor Gear for your, uh, uh, the great uh, presentation. I have uh, shown you to the concept of the computational homogenization. I have, a, uh, I have a general question about the main philosophy of, philosophy of the computational homogenization. Um, I asked about your recommendation about uh, the application of the homogenization in a material with, uh, for example, higher um, heterogeneity. Uh, also uh, using uh, this method uh, uh, through the framework of statistical uh, thermodynamics. Do you have any recommendation or suggestion about these concepts? Um, yeah, the recommendations of you, what exactly do you want to know? So, uh, For example, uh, you, you talk about the, for example, application of the computational uh, homogenization in materials. Uh -huh. Uh, is it applicable to use this method, uh, computational homogenization, in a material with, uh, for example, uh, containing a high uh, heterogeneity, such as uh, concrete or soft tissues? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's what it was designed for. Eh? So this computational homogenization uh, is particularly meant to deal with a large level of heterogeneity at a micro scale. Now, on the other hand, I also always warn as well, it's not the holy grail because you still need to use the proper constitutive equations at the micro scale. If you're modeling your individual phases in the micro scale with wrong equations, then something wrong will come out. So what you're just doing is that you push the, the question of the constitutive equations from the macro scale to the micro scale where different phases live together in this heterogeneous medium, but they need to be good. So if you are capable of doing that microscale computation correctly, 
and accurately, then I guess computational homogenization will really mean something. But uh, of course, if you don't have good models at the micro scale, computational homogenization won't help. Like they say, rubbish in is rubbish out. Hmm? Uh, thanks. Uh, also, I have another question about the, for example, uh, uh, about the uh, relationship between the computational homogenization with the, for example, statistical thermodynamics or the uh, thermodynamically averaging method. Is there any connection between these concepts? Well, there's a kind of a connection, I guess, with, with, with parts of what I've been saying and, and, uh, and coarse graining methods. I think the coarse graining methods and uh, particularly I think at, uh, at the generic scheme, I think with certain aspects, they, they, uh, they really aim for uh, closed form equations as well. But in most cases, they also go beyond just uh, mechanics and, and, and the simple kinematics that we have considered in the computational homogenization problems. Uh, I think that uh, if you really can come up with a coarse grain continuum that is rather accurate, then that's always what you should prefer. Uh, this is also what, uh, what I guess what statistical thermodynamics is largely after. So they, they try to come up with um, closed form constitutive equations that as accurately as possible describe what this heterogeneous medium is doing. <clears throat> I think the, the, these enriched schemes have a kind of a simple objective. They, they also want to do this. Uh, but in, in some cases, there are lots of temporal phenomena playing a role. And I, I think this is in, in uh, statistical thermodynamics very important. That is the, the heavily fluctuating time scales. So I think that uh, we have a still modest way in which we deal with uh, the homogenization in time. And, and this is actually a, a more focal point of statistical thermodynamics based methods, like, for instance, um, uh, the generic scheme. Thanks. Thanks for your. Uh, recommendations. Um, Liwa. Hi, Liwa. Nice to see you. <laughs> hey, nice to see you. Nice to see everybody. <laughs> Hi, Professor uh, Mark Pierce. Uh, this is Li Hua Jing. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at UCLA. Yeah, I also work on metal materials, but I'm not very familiar with homogenization. Uh, those materials are highly anisotropic. So is it true that uh, uh, those homogenization method is for a specific loading condition? And then uh, is it possible, let's say I'm interested in uh, behavior, material behavior in a specific direction, but is it possible say by doing homogenization in a few directions, I can confidently predict the behavior in another direction? Yeah. So the, the, or the different method, loading condition. Yeah. The, the, the method is not restricted to isotropy at all. So uh, an isotropy can be, can be naturally dealt with. So that's, that's definitely not a restriction. Uh, what, what is often maybe interesting and relevant in, uh, in materials design is that you also look at the inverse problem. In, in one of the papers that was on the sheet where I mentioned the literature, there's one paper that uh, I haven't said, shown anything about it that particularly tries to touch on that question, that to exploit the homogenization scheme to, to get a more direct relation between uh, what you design as a material and which are the effective properties that come out. Uh, because this is exactly what you need if you want to uh, look into the inverse question of how do I need to change the material such that I get the effective properties I want. And that includes uh, directional properties if, if this is what you're after. So I think uh, an isotropy is, is not a limitation, not at all. Okay, so actually I have a question too. So, um, so, um, I was, I mean, really interested by uh, the diffusion part and uh, the general form you obtained for your emerging constitutive laws, which shows, you know, uh, non-classical uh, state laws or kinetic relation between chemical potential and concentration, for example. So it turns out that Ji Yang and I, we proposed uh, phenomenologically also that there could be a on equilibrium relationship between chemical potential and concentration, but the motivation was different. Um, but we also had this fact that, you know, uh, for constant chemical potential, you can have an evolution of concentration, uh, for example, due to uh, viscosity or um, in the case where concentration is coupled to a change in volume or also for uh, different uh, speed or diffusion uh, properties in the microstructure. So my question is, um, can we use maybe 
the emerging constitutive law you found to somehow validate or maybe contradict what we proposed earlier? Or can you tell me if it is compatible to mm -hmm. what we yeah. proposed before? So, uh, but, uh, what, uh, what came out was, of course, mm -hmm. the constitutive equations, they are enriched and they can be additional terms. And some of these terms, if you look at them, uh, are not immediately logical. You would think, ah, what does this term contribute in the constitutive equation? But of course, depending on, on the problem that you're investigating, if you then look into the numbers of the constitutive coefficient, and some of them are very small up to negligible, which means that, well, this term is there theoretically, but practically it is almost negligible. So can you use it? Well, that I think you can use it up to the point that um, the materials that you adopt uh, fall into the relaxed scale separation regime that was assumed there from the onset, and, and, and the other point, of course, is that the, the decomposition which we've made between steady state and transient is possible. So if you start to include certain nonlinear effects that uh, does not make that possible, then, of course, you should be careful. So uh, for as long as you respect the conditions, I think you, you could indeed check even what those coefficients are. So because you can then compute these coefficients of in the, the constitutive coefficients and see what their values are. And then it gives you an indication how important that particular term is or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that means that um, if you take more like a macroscopic point of view and you just want to propose a, a macroscopic continuum model, you could use the, the structure that emerged from your homogenization as a, as a guide basically to allow you, to, yeah. Okay. So my, my next question is, uh, how, how far do you think you can go with this computational homogenization? And do you still, is there still space for people who try to do things analytically or will computation solve everything at some point? Uh, or another way, to, as a question is, is there, is there um, an interest, a benefit in trying to develop some sort of mean field approaches that would give you this equation in closed form? possibly with this enriched continuum? Well, as, as you've seen, certain, well, several, <coughs> quite often the result was an enriched continuum in which we, yeah, we had to do uh, offline computations. That's true, but in the end, it's just an enriched continuum that is left behind, which you can, which you can solve that. Uh, how far is this off a, a mean field theory in which you also try to rationalize on the structure of the governing equations and and, and maybe do the, the offline reasoning in, an, in a different way. I mean, perhaps it comes closer, closer than, than, than it was to other mean field approaches. I think computational homogenization in its, in its root form is definitely far off because it's just everything computationally and you're still stuck to this micro scale analysis that you have to do continuously. But if you can come up with a method in which you exploit decompositions, model reduction, and you end up with an enriched continuum and equations that go along with it, then you are actually uh, trying to hit the same target as, as what the mean field uh, method is doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I still have another question, maybe. Um, you mentioned earlier that there was maybe no benefit really to try to go into the uh, history dependent behavior, at least for the, the mechanical uh, part, because the material, meta material you have in mind are mostly hyper elastic. But for the diffusion problem, like with the example of batteries, uh, definitely there is a lot of non-linearity and also uh, history dependency because you have plastic deformation in the electrode, for example, and also non-linearity in the mechanical behavior and in the uh, state law for the, 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 the chemistry as well. So for that particular problem, um, do you have idea of how to, to address that? Yeah, well, like, like I said, I mean, uh, certain parts of the framework relied on uh, principles like, to give one example again, the, the decomposition between steady state and transient is not always the trivial the history and nonlinear phenomena playing a role. Um, I find it hard to, to give a clear answer. It, it all depends on what exactly you want to take on board. Um, and uh, if you, uh, what, what the problem is that you're exactly interested in. Um, I won't say neither that nothing is possible, but whatever you do will probably need, is going to be an extension and may, may require careful reconsiderations of some of the assumptions made in the present scheme. 
and likely modifications are necessary. I can only state that if it becomes heavily nonlinear, then, then at some point they become pessimistic and say it will no longer be possible. If too many things uh, spoil the complexity, then, uh, then probably it becomes more and more impossible. So, Jigang, you had a, another question. Yeah, I have a, a technical question. Uh, maybe uh, Marius, the talk is so interesting <laughs> and deep. Maybe it twists my mind into uh, some some dark alley. Well, I want to uh, so now um, now of course a traditional continuum mechanics setup is a separate scale, right? Uh, at a small scale, I have a material model, and mm -hmm. at large scale, I have a PDE, right? So mm -hmm. I just think whether you 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 are saying is a, a generalization in the following sense. Um, one effective way to do con traditional continuum mechanics uh, is I actually get a material model through measurement, experimental measurement. I have a framework for continuum mechanical, uh, for example, hyperelasticity. Then all I need to do is find an energy density function, right? So that's uh, so in that scheme, for example, acceleration is not a variable, right? In your material model, it's just a deformation well, gradient is variable. So, can I think in the, in your group also uh, do experiment? Is that mm -hmm. possible? Replace your small scale thing with an experiment, and with extra degrees of freedom, and almost like an internal variable. Maybe acceleration is also a variable. Is that possible? Well, well, in some way we have not shown it, but uh, it, we have also done experiments on these mm -hmm. mechanical materials. So let's say the Katya's uh, material, so to speak, to mm. basically also uh, load it and then basically use uh, digital image correlation techniques to basically map out the the different five fields, which are actually the molds, the patterns mm -hmm. that are unregistered. So yeah. we've actually done that experimentally. So experimentally, you can extract patterns and you can also, well, once you assume that the pattern exists, you can also quantify the, the amplitude of that mm -hmm. particular pattern in the measurement that you've actually done. So that is possible, yes, we, we have done that. Um, but if you then ask, what is then the added value of doing this experimentally, because you have, of course have an enormous computational toolbox behind it. I think the main, the main point is, of course, is that if you do it experimentally, you can almost in an unbiased way identify what are the relevant patterns and, and their amplitudes uh, without having assumed anything yet. Mm -hmm. Because you measure a full displacement field and you have that experimental result available and you can look at the decomposition thereof in terms of summation of patterns. Yeah. So yeah. If, if it comes to, to the other point, uh, uh, everything that is dynamics, um, we, we, have, we have done some um, experimental work um, well, the last point, which I'm not showing anything on this because it was not homogenization, but for the nonlinear metamaterial, so the nonlinear dynamical metamaterial, we have actually shown experimentally uh, some um, peculiar effects. And that was actually what I showed in the, the very last conclusion where I hinted to the two nonlinear metamaterial papers. That is also experimental work. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the specific question I have is, uh... Maybe it's just my misunderstanding. So can I view your small scale problem? You have two scales, right? Big scale, small scale. The small scale scale, in a sense, a generalization of a constitutive model. Can I think that way? Uh, well, you can, yes, you can, you can, you can. And the whole, the whole point is that uh, the, the small scale shows features that are not easily captured in a, a standard continuum theory. And, and this is what you exactly try to improve on. And I guess part of the story is also the fact that the small scale is not that small. I yeah, mean, sure. It's not, we're not talking about atoms. We're talking actually no. about materials that actually have features which are small, but not really negligibly small. Yeah, 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 you know, uh, I have something specific in mind. Suppose you make a standard metal material, periodic structure, let's say, right? And, uh, but uh, each unit cell is well-defined experimentally because you, you make it. Mm -hmm. So presumably I can run experiment 
on unit cell. Yeah. Uh, so of course, I, the unit cell itself is not a homogeneous. Uh, so you need to have some guidance. What do I need to measure on this unit cell? Perhaps acceleration become uh, variable. Perhaps I cannot just use a deformation gradient. I need to have something else. Is that possible you give some guideline? So instead of doing you know, full field measurement or and do just a measurement of a unit cell with yeah. extra measurement, and then I can plug in continuum calculation to do mm -hmm. you know, 100,000 unit cell behavior. So is that a possibility? Yeah, but I, don't, I think you don't need to measure more than the time resolved displacement field. That's mm -hmm. all you need. And at the, yeah. at the, if you measure at the unit cell level, just yeah. track down how the unit cell is displacing yeah. and deforming. That's all you need at the small scale. So the whole the whole machinery doesn't live really at the unit, the unit cell problem. It lives in the scale transition up to the large scale. This is where actually the whole machinery, because you want to replace, you want to wipe out the heterogeneities and put an effect continuum instead. Sure. Yeah. But you must measure some, some sense of measure the force, right? Otherwise, how can you couple this unit cell to a larger structure? That's, that's, that's always the case in any, any uh, DIC yeah. problem. Yeah. You always need to complement your measurements by something that uh, allows yeah. you to, to force or elasticity constant or whatever, absolutely. OK, thank you. Thank you. That, OK. Thank you, Mark. This is a tremendous talk. It's really uh, refreshing. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So, uh, are there any more questions from um, anyone, really? Uh, just uh, manifest yourself in some way. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's it. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I still have a couple of maybe more general questions, um, yeah. uh, if it's OK. Or, yeah, please. Um, yeah, yeah. So maybe that will trigger. Uh, further question, maybe you can expand a little bit uh, the scope. I, I was just wondering, Mark, um, what, what, what was the next step for you uh, or your, your, your big challenge that you would like to address next uh, in this field? Yeah. Well, in this field, I think what is, what is not solved, and I think I made that already clear a number of times, is that um, I don't think we're still underperforming in, in finite uh, domains. And uh, um, it starts to be clear where the problem lives. The problem lives in the boundary conditions. So uh, we can uh, dream up nice homogenized continua, but in the end, they have so many degrees of freedom. So don't forget, they have as many degrees of freedom as projection functions. So, um, and they all live at the boundary as well. So at, in your physical problem, you just have, for instance, an excitation through a prescribed displacement. And in your high order continuum, you have maybe 20 degrees of freedom that needs to go parallel with that. So it's a non-unique problem, that boundary condition. And uh, the, the method, we, we have a solution, but it's not a good one. It's uh, also not fully energetically consistent. So I think more is needed. So basically, in general, I would say it needs to, the dynamic framework needs to be pushed to solving real boundary value problems, initial boundary value problems. The second point, I guess, is that there is a lot more to gain from nonlinearity in that domain. And of course, that will, uh, and that I, when I'm talking about moderate nonlinearity, so in the dynamic, in the dynamic context, uh, where you uh, take benefit of autoparametric resonance and all kind of peculiar effects to basically get more out of these materials than you would only be capable of doing if it was linear only. So this is typically something, uh, also for Vara Kuznetsova, by the way, I, I want to give lots of credits to her. She's also doing great work in this. On the mechanical metamaterials, um, it's, it's, the future is about actuation, I guess. This is what people are looking for. Um, many people ask, what's it good for? What can you do with it? Um, and people are looking for smarter and smarter ways to also actuate these materials. And if you can do the actuation smart, then you can also take benefit that it's a material which has different mechanical modes. So which means uh, depending on the mode in which you trigger the material, it will be stiff or not stiff. And, and, and in many applications, it can be important that you can tune that and control that and to, to make yeah, no novel applications and devices out of this. And I guess this is also something which is really important for, for the future thereof. Now, I guess homogenization will remain necessary eh, because we, uh, 
we cannot do our computations with uh, full resolution of these heterogeneous materials in all the engineering applications of the future. It's not going to be possible. So these homogenized models in one way or another will be needed because uh, to, to basically to make it possible for the engineers to work with. Now, we do have a big step because I don't think that many engineers doing design would be at this moment, let's say, be open for solving their problems with enriched and emergent continua of which they may not really understand what it's all about. So uh, as usual, it takes a long time before such methods basically land at the, on the work floor of the industry that basically uh, try to exploit it. So, um, and maybe that's what we should, should hope as well. In the context of the dynamical metamaterials, um, I have oh, Mark, before here. you're going on, uh, before, so I have a specific question about what you just said. For example, uh, you talk about uh, applications. Uh, one very, very successful metamaterial, if you wish, is composite, right? Polymer matrix, a strong fiber composite, or ceramic matrix, strong fiber composite. That development uh, started in 1930s, and now mm -hmm. they're used. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to consider the most significant advances in material science uh, in last century, just making composite mm -hmm. much better than any steel, any polymer you can make. So yeah. now uh, in terms of metal material, it's, a, it's also kind of composite. So what do you think are the distinct new features of a new type of uh, uh, meta material, just uh, um, you well, everything, everything dynamic rooted, behavior. Yeah, sure. Everything is rooted in these emergent properties, huh? so uh -huh. that fact that you can uh, one of yeah. the, the applications that we're we're still really working on at this moment is to uh, to basically uh, use it as, as as noise insulation material, yeah. um, where you do much better than the classical acoustic forms that are nowadays on the market. Huh? So that's, that's one example. So you really want to, these special effective properties is what makes those materials of interest. Mm -hmm. Now, there are not yet many applications that basically could exploit all these emergent and effective properties. Mm -hmm. But I think a sound barrier is a clear one. And this mm -hmm. is also something for which there could be potentially a large market. Mm -hmm. So this is where we uh, have been working on the metaforms. So the metaforms are essentially acoustic forms with such a locally embedded resonator in it. Yeah. Uh, the theory thereof is, of course, again, nice and, and maybe connected to one of the previous questions. Making it in practice is a different story. Huh? Mm -hmm. So because you need to make a form and they're all little heavy vibrating masses in that form that basically interact with the waves that basically penetrate through the form. Now, why a metaform? Because, I mean, at high frequencies, the resonance is not that important. The resonance mainly works at lower frequencies. So at higher frequencies, it's thermal viscal dissipation that basically makes sure that there is enough absorption into the form. So you want to combine the best of both. I mean, acoustic forms are on the market, uh, but you want to make them perform better in the low frequency regime. I think this is a clear application of such a property. Uh, so it is clearly heterogeneous material, but it's only interesting because of this meta property. That's what makes the, the material interesting. Not its standard behavior, but the meta property makes it interesting. Thank you. Maybe that is uh, what, what really leads to real progress. So for example, uh, let's uh, return to well-established material, composite material. Let's say ceramic matrix composite. You and I know you, I, I know you work on similar materials before. So ceramic material has all, very important emergent property because both ceramics are brittle, yet composite is extremely tough. And we know what going on over the decades, how brittle plus brittle become tough, the emergent. So over the years, the mechanics and the material science were developed to make sure that emergent property are understood and well used. So maybe the, the, the thing for, I guess, uh, us to do is uh, make a list of a possibly important emergent properties and look mm -hmm. at them. So mm -hmm. you just mentioned the sound uh, uh, barrier property. Any other examples you know about 
that emerging problem, people clearly identify useful, important. What, what are these examples? Uh, well, maybe the first to, to yeah. go a little bit deeper, the word emergent. Huh? Yeah. Um, if we, uh, sometimes you need to distinguish an extreme property from an emergent property. Uh, oh. I think it's okay. not necessarily the same. So an extreme okay. property is a property that would still fall into the traditional um, understanding and the traditional theory, mm -hmm. but which takes exceptional values. Okay, right? all right. Yeah. Still admissible values. Yeah. Whereas if we're talking about emergent properties, then something is happening that it does not fit into the existing mm -hmm. theory. So okay. for instance, the, neg the negative uh, effective mass and the negative effective bulk models are typical okay. examples of something that is something that we normally do not encounter in a continuum material. So right. something, what does it effectively mean? It means that the theory is no longer valid. And because of course it's an effective measure that becomes negative, but it, because if you apply it, you compute that effective value with the standard theory. And the theory that is no longer exact or complete, and this is actually where it shows that all the phenomena are actually propagating on the larger scale. So extreme and emergent are, are perhaps a little bit uh, different. So if we, if we call it emergent if, uh, if, a prop, if a property pops up that, uh, uh, that was not, uh, not present in the, in the formulation at hand. Uh, then, then well, it from a user's perspective, uh, all that's important is an unusual property that's not available otherwise, right? It doesn't matter how we label it. So extreme can, also, extreme can also be unusual, like for instance, a very high stiffness or a very yeah. high yield yeah. is yeah. not emergent, it is extreme. Yeah, sure. But uh, or, so let's say uh, the unusual properties that wasn't available before or hard, very hard to do. So uh, uh, you mentioned the sound barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other good examples? Well, yeah. In terms of, of uh, wave, it's, it's yeah. wave mitigation. Huh? So it basically, uh, wave mitigation means uh, uh, stopping waves, redirecting waves, channeling waves. Uh, and you can do that, of course, well, we're looking at sound waves in this case, but you can also do that with thermal waves, yeah. uh, even fusional waves, where you want to manipulate where the wave or the matter or the heat is going and flowing. Yeah. and. Uh, and the, well, it depends, of course, a lot on what, what you want to do with it. So if you want to basically in energy harvesting, you, for instance, want to bring everything to a particular area to, uh -huh. to make sure that you can harvest. Uh -huh. So this is essentially what these materials are, are dedicated for, to basically manipulate the waves inside matter. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. So and are, are there well-defined uh, numbers to describe this effect, like to make a Nashby plot, for example, where <laughs> you could uh, cover the range of uh, emergent properties and, and use your methods to cover, uh, to explore uh, yeah. unoccupied areas of the Nashby plot? Yeah, well, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you could, yeah. Like, like I said, if you look at effective properties, then uh, you would go into the negative regime, uh, which probably in, uh, in HB's plots is not foreseen. Huh? So indeed, you go into regions which were uh, so set inadmissible. Huh? So no materials exist with that particular property. Uh, yeah, the question is, is that, a, is that a proper way of doing? Because it, it basically assumes that you're, uh, you still uh, assume that the material behaves with the, the standard uh, framework, you compute this effective quantity and say, hey, it's negative. This is actually how it works. So I wonder whether you should make HB plots uh, with those quantities, so the effective quantities, or whether you should then make HB plots uh, for enriched continua, which, which gives a reinterpretation of the properties. Huh? And that's, uh, yeah, that's then the key question. Sure, it's interesting to, to have a look always good to have a look at what is the dimensional space, which properties could be at reach, and, and what can be made for which purpose. Yes, I think it could be interesting, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something something to ask to, to, to Norman, huh? so, uh, to ask Norman to uh, extend his, his graphs to include these regions. <laughs> I do not know whether, whether Vikram is still there, but Vikram could do uh, otherwise. Vikram is uh, with his kids. He, uh, <laughs> yeah. he has to uh, pick up <laughs> his kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I still have another question about just um, asking you if you are also make these materials in your lab. Have you 
try to make some based on the insight from your model? We have made the, the mechanical metamaterial. That's something we've made. So we've done also some, some really measurements on that. So the, the, the kinematics, measuring the kinematics. So that's what we've done. And in terms of the uh, dynamic metamaterials, uh, it's all the metaforms that we're working in the lab. So that's really the acoustic forms with uh, embedded particles that uh, have to serve as resonators. And the third example was actually, but it's a rather large structure, was actually the, uh, the, the nonlinear metamaterial to basically illustrate this uh, appearance of the subharmonic attenuation zone for a nonlinear metamaterial. So these are the three subjects we, we touched upon in the lab. And uh, on the metaforms is still ongoing. Um, that that will, it will continue. So uh, definitely, usually we, we always seek for some experimental parallel work. Since the subject of this talk was homogenization, I didn't say much on the experimental work that, that also happened. I had to make choices. Sure. But it might be a good way to convince uh, maybe uh, industries or uh, to actually yes. yeah, fabricate but, but, it and show it works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but of course, then, then you really want to give a stronger, uh, stronger emphasis on the application, huh? which yeah. I, I guess I mean, the sound, the sound uh, absorption or sound uh, attenuation application is actually for many people a very clear one. Huh? You can easily understand that that's useful and that makes sense. Huh? That's a, a rather trivial example, I would say. Yes, Nishin, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I would like to ask uh, another, you know, extra question about the little bit technique. What I think uh, recall your slides. So I remember in your slides you showed the um, upscale calculation and downscale calculation. Um, so I just wondering, you know, um, what kind of principle or law for you to use to judge to detect what kind of defects you can, you know, ignore them to upscale or something defects or some holes, flaws, you cannot, you know, judge them to, to upscale. You need to downscale to see them. So I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> sure, but there, well, the downscaling only concerns the, the average kinematics, not more than this. This is what you downscale. So you give some properties of the kinematics at the micro scale. So the average fields, this is what you give to the, the small scale domain. Now, if you're talking about the defects and the flaws and the holes and so on, they live at the small scale. And there are no really restrictions on what you can take on board. So you can make uh, it as heterogeneous as you want, this micro scale problem. And so this micro scale problem has its own governing equations for all the phases which are in there. It only sees a kinematical field which it gets on a larger scale. That's what you basically do. And what we're doing is actually you solve that fine scale problem. And sometimes we do that in the offline stage, as you've seen, such that we can condense it out. And the corresponding average properties, like forces and stiffness quantities, these are the quantities which go back in the upscaling relations. So, and it does not put real restrictions on what to include at the fine scale, other than, for instance, what I talked about earlier, you need to be careful that your homogenization conditions remain satisfied. Scale separation, you assume something from the start, this must always be satisfied. And the, well, the typical example that violates it is localization. So if it starts to localize at the, the micro scale, then all of a sudden you enter a regime where your homogenization conditions are no longer satisfied. I don't know whether I make it very clear for um, like this in a nutshell, but uh, you should of course yeah. read much more about it. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, Mark, yeah, yeah, okay, Mark, very good. Uh, just following up uh, this. So today you restrict your talk mostly on the method development of uh, uh, homogene uh, homogeneity, uh, that method. Yeah. Uh, all right, so that's wonderful deep. Um, but you also have interest even in your own lab to construct matter materials with unusual emergent properties. Mm -hmm. Now, sounds like an interesting thing. Now, if our EML webinar want to invite people to actually talk about uh, you know, physical application or imagination of a mechanical kind of the matter materials, with the dramatic properties, who are the 
right groups uh, to consider. You must interact with these people, know some of these. I know Katya is doing something. Now I also heard you're doing something. Who else? Uh, Nick Fund was doing something in the beginning. You, you talk mainly on the experimental work now? Yeah, exper just a physical work. People actually not interested per se uh, method development, just interested in new application, new property, interested. Mm -hmm. Who are doing these things? From experimental work, so I mean, I do not know many people that, for instance, are, are working on both dynamical and mechanical metamaterials. Yeah. So right. uh, I think most of the time they're actually working on, on, on one of them. Yeah. Uh, the well, experimental work, the experiment, I think many, many people are typically on the dynamical case because these are not so trivial experiments. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, on the dynamic case, in the dynamic case, of course, on forms, there's a lot of work, but on the dynamical metamaterials, they're actually mostly in the physics community, more than in oh. the, the mechanical mechanics community, actually doing that kind of work. Now, uh, one colleague I have in, uh, in the Netherlands, which is also in the physics community, by the way, and actually doing some experimental work on mechanical materials, a short, short one result, is Martin van Hecke. Uh -huh. So he's really making these materials, testing them, um, and, and try to get out the peculiar behavior. He can, he can give very nice lectures also, by the way. So, so, so uh, I'll send an email to remind you, uh, so because you're in the community now, make some suggestions. I'll look it yeah. up. It sounds interesting, really interesting. You could give so, a very nice sure. Yeah, today you only covered a methodology development, which is one oh, aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Very uh, just getting out of, I think we're wrapping up now. Uh, for do you i don't know if anyone has asked this before but uh, as i'm graduating now i'm thinking about mm -hmm. you know how is the availability of funding um, research fund is going to change after the pandemic if you see like in the next like two years if there is gonna you expect that's gonna be a change and you know how is the life of a young faculty is gonna be right now Ah, hard to say, you know, find that hard. This is a rather difficult question. I mean, of course, there are some uh, some industrial sectors that indeed suffer from uh, from it. Uh, other sectors do not suffer. So it, it is very sectorial, depends a lot on, on uh, where your research is located and whether you're in a branch that suffers from it or not. Uh, that at least concerns the part that comes from industry. I do not expect uh, major changes in, let's say, the, the science funding instruments. Uh, even though in Europe we, uh, we have a debate on this, that maybe the European Research Council would uh, basically get less funding, we'll see. Uh, I do not expect major changes there. I think what is, what is perhaps more important for young faculty is, is to basically make sure that if you start up, that you have a good network such that, for instance, for getting the funding, that you're not on your own. Uh, because if you're on your own, I see really people struggling if they're on their own and uh, have to do everything themselves and cannot rely on some support, then it's difficult. Uh, a young faculty often can also take benefit from entering a few collaboration projects where they do not have that pressure yet of getting the, all the funding, but where they can basically already scientifically score. Uh, and this is, this is a good combination you need to look for. So, um, I mean, uh, if you work individually, then you really get all the, the trouble on your shoulders. If you try to team up with a few colleagues, then, uh, then I think you can do more and also maybe sense a little bit less pressure of, uh, of the funding as well. Of course, you'll, you'll need it. Huh? I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that you will not need it, but you, you don't want uh, to be in a situation where you almost get sick of uh, writing uh, proposals and, and not receiving the grants and uh, and getting frustrated from it, of course, that's what you that's the last thing you would want. Yeah. Good, good advice. Yeah. Um, sorry, Zikang, may I suggest something to, regarding to your question to yeah. Professor yeah. Mark Gears yeah. uh, about people who are studying on mechanical and acoustical metamaterials? Yeah. Maybe Professor Andre uh, Norris, I think he is oh, from. Yes. I know him. Yeah, and uh, Professor Wakakis and Bergman from University of Illinois. Oh, uh, uh, Norris, I uh, note down. Uh, who else? Uh, Wakakis. Uh, how do you maybe? Can, can you send me an email? 
Uh, certainly, I will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Very helpful. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating area. I just know vaguely through Katya, okay, she has another paper on this kind of thing. <laughs> maybe you need to, <laughs> maybe maybe need to launch a new else. journal. Huh? <laughs> maybe you need to launch the Emergent Mechanics Letters journal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. all right. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Mark, are you going to write a short overview for the, your talk, your webinar? You remember my invitation? Uh, I remember invitation. You, I, I don't know yet. <laughs> I, have to, I have to check what exactly you asked. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll remind you. It's optional. But this is a wonderful talk. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, for uh, giving the opportunity. Uh, so it was a great event. So, uh, and it's, it's surprising how quickly time flies in this discussion time thereafter. I mean, two hours, they fly by like it's nothing, huh? Yeah, 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 it's nothing, yeah. So this is uh, something you can only do really uh, online. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. You can do that in a. This is something. This is something you cannot do at a conference because typically the discussion session is 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 only possible in this way. And whereas at a conference you you can't sit with such a large group discussing for two hours in this way. That's not possible. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. something to keep maybe, huh? The, yeah. Yeah. So we're now EML webinar is assuming. I actually agree with you the traditional conference should persist. We are yeah. assuming that it will persist. We're doing something, I guess, uh, uh, add additional value to traditional yeah, sure. conference you... rather than in competition or instead of, it's yeah. just different. It's a different That's just yeah. 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 All right. Thank you, Lawrence. Wonderful. Thank, yeah. thank you for... Yeah. Proposing to yeah to organize this that's, that's yeah, quite yeah. fun. Yeah. So you did you did a great job. So it was a pleasure to uh, <laughs> have you in the lead. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right, then we wrap up. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good. And, uh, Bye. See you at the next uh, meeting or webinar or wherever. Hmm? Yeah. 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 Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thanks all. <laughs>